Well, good uh, good morning to our friends on the West Coast. Happy lunch to the East Coast. And then I'm uh, I'm somewhere here. I'm going to do brunch. It's around 11. Time to have my uh, granola bar, drink my coffee. Um, we're going to let, uh, let our attendees keep uh, filing in right now. Uh, this was certainly, um, judging by registration, a very popular topic. Um, networking is something that... Uh, you cannot escape. It's officially here. It's staying. It's not going anywhere, right? Uh, if you're at home, you're watching TV. Most likely, you're watching TV via the network at some point. It is touching a network at nearly every point in its creation to distribution. So um, in the audio industry, obviously, we've been living in networking now for, for quite a while broadcast uh, a much longer time. So today, just to do some level setting real quick, this is going to cover basics and, and what I would consider to be some intermediate um, information, but we're, we're going to start building from the ground up here. Uh, I know for many of the folks, um, I recognize a lot of names and I know that you have a lot of capabilities in this area. So some of this you know, if, if, if you feel like, yeah, I got a pretty good grasp on that, go fill up your coffee cup, all right? And, you know, keep on with us. I guarantee you, even while we were reviewing this morning, I found a couple things that, that kind of snuck in. I'm like, oh, that explains that, right? And, and um, I'll tell you that we will have coming up um, in next week will be a 2110 discussion with Riedel. And that discussion will get into um, a lot more uh, details around, you know, obviously their products that use, you know, P2P, that use um, uh, boundary clocking, that, that have a lot of those um, more advanced um, concepts. But uh, we're trying to build on this here. So unlike in uh, episodes past where we kind of come in from here, there, wherever, down, up, we're purposely coming in today, starting and building up, right? And um, Joel and Doug from Sure are joining us today. Um, these guys are um, uh, intimately involved with both the development of products that are networked and helping customers implement those networked products. And uh, Joel has, uh, has a lot of experience with um, the field and folks like me calling up going, hey, you know, I just can't seem to make this work, and I'm pretty sure your your it's your your box, it's broken. And uh, come to find out, may have just uh, met nothing quite that bad. Um, it's just simply, hey, we're living in an, in an ecosystem now that is being shared by a lot of other folks. But also joining us today is Ben Harris from Claire Global. Um, ben and I met via LinkedIn. Um, this is the world we live in right now, where it was like, hey, you know what? We're talking about this topic. I'm going to reach out to somebody. And we got to know each other. And we're like, hey, you know what? Why don't you join us and, and talk about how does a company implement these ideas? Because Joel and, and Doug, they're helping to bring products to market that we're all using and have this functionality built in. And then we get it and we're like, okay, so how do we do this? So that's what I've invited Ben for. Ben works um, at Claire in the with the engineering department heads trying to implement these best practices and the standards of how their tour packages are gonna go out. Um, every single show is gonna have a network device in it. And um, uh, so he's gonna be kind of following along today and helping to bring that that vendor or that user application back in. I'll come in every so often with a really dumb question, which is something I feel like I'm pretty good at. And, um, you know, uh, meanwhile, question and answers. This is probably going to be a pretty big Q&A day is my guess. So, Pete, Mac, good morning. Good afternoon. Um, morning. Well, why, don't you, uh, why don't you talk folks through the Q&A portion of this and, uh, you know, we'll start getting ready. I think our attendees are still coming in, but we, we got another another few uh, few sure. folks. Sure. Uh, most most of you are probably familiar with uh, how this Q&A works because you've been here for other other webinars. But in your GoToWebinar control panel, there's a little pull down tab that says questions. 
and there'll be a field in there for you to ask questions. Uh, we do expect a lot, and it's probably unlikely we'll get to them all, but we will get to as many as we can. So whatever you're asking, you know, feel free to ask it and uh, put it in the question tab. Um, and we will get to it, uh, some of them going through the webinar, some of them at little Q&A sections built into the presentation. Um, yeah, I, and that, I, yeah, I think that's about all there is to explain on questions, that, but that's, uh, you know, we will be curating them, uh, but we'll get to all the topics. Pete? I was really excited to see we were doing this show because uh, even though I use networking all the time, uh, there's deep, dark secrets, which I have never uh, yeah. discovered. So uh, uh, this show and uh, the Riedel Tuesday at 3 p.m. next week uh, on Simpty 2110 are going to be absolutely engrossing for me. And it, uh, I'm going to give it off, give it over to you. Go for, go for it. Yeah, I, I agree. No matter how many times I use the networks, every show I come up against something that is a stumbling block. So looking forward to you guys. Take it away. All right. Perfect. Thank you, Matt, Peter, and also Ben. Uh, I'm joining here from my home office with Doug. My name is Joel. Again, I'll present my screen here. It should be the networking intro and best practices uh, webinar that we'll go through today. Um, applications engineer, more so on the networking side. So hopefully I can shed some light on uh, some of the intro or basics, maybe get into some intermediate uh, networking, either troubleshooting steps, best practices, and things we have seen in the field, or also in um, with working with other manufacturers. Uh, first, we'll go over uh, the topics here. There are five modules. We'll first go through a review of networking uh, basics and best practices with Doug. And then second, I'll go over understanding IP addresses um, what it means to have a static link local or DHC app, uh, IP address, as well as subnetting uh, at its basic level. Then we'll go next into networking the computer to an audio uh, to an audio network, either on an isolated AVV LAN or part of a commingled network on a corporate environment. And then fourth, for the fourth topic, we'll discuss networking Dante devices themselves, as well as the difference between uh, Dante AES67, why you would choose one over the other and some of the, the network security parts or, or roles that network security plays in networking Dante and Audio AES67 devices. And then for the last topic, we'll go into troubleshooting common networking issues, things we've seen in the field, but also in the applications engineering group and as a vendor with Sure. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them anytime, and we'll get to some of those questions as they mentioned and shed some light on this. But uh, first, Topic one, Doug, you want to go ahead with review? Uh, yeah. Uh, again, real quick, my name is Doug Dobby, and I work in uh, the product management uh, group responsible for networked uh, products. So as it relates to uh, networking, it's uh, been a growth curve uh, for me. I uh, started my first project that sure was analog microphones. Didn't have to do anything to do with uh, networking but gradually over the years. In fact, I think, uh, Kelly, my, one of my first recollections of uh, Working with this was back in uh, mid '90s uh, with you collaborating on some early gear and wireless workbench and that kind of uh, uh, networking, uh, exploring that. Um, so anyway, I'm in the product management uh, group. Joel is in the uh, systems support group. So all of the uh, networking questions come to his uh, his group. Um, anything that's a little bit um, you know more advanced and uh, uh, troublesome to uh, get at. Um, then I bring in some of the deeper, you know, PhD engineering people uh, to either, you know, join a call with Joel or even go on site. And uh, that enables him to remote into my machine to dig into networks. So that's kind of how we collaborate. I'm going to start with some of the networking uh, basics and go through some of those. And just because they're basics doesn't mean they're uh, not uh, relevant or not important because these turn out to be some of the, the, the most common problems that are still out there. So just to uh, remind you or raise awareness that these uh, uh, type of things are 
um, kind of fundamental and important. Uh, the first of which is cables. Uh, and the message that uh, we want to share here is to always check your cables. You know, you would you would check your um, XLR cables and either repair them or toss them when they break. You got to do the same thing, uh, especially and even more so with uh, Cat5 cables, with Ethernet cables, because um, they have these flimsy little retention tabs uh, that tend to break. Uh, if you are, you know, a little careless or they even kind of break on their own just in, in transport or knocking into each other, you can kind of see that once that tab bends beyond a certain, you know, degree, that thing will just, you know, break off. And what happens then? Uh, it might work. It might not. It might work for the first, you know, hour and then stop working or somebody might just uh shift your you know gearbox you know an inch and then it stops working so in any case more important than you think uh so trust these you know plug them in look for their you know indication lights that they're working um by the by, by the port you plug them into but but do verify them um, as far as the cables themselves you really don't want to be pinching or over tightening these, you don't want to like, you know, uh, take a, a twist tie and like tightly wrap, you know, 10 or 20 of these cables uh, together. They they tend not to like that, both from a reliability standpoint and they can also induce some noise uh, into themselves. Uh, below, we've got kind of uh, three categories uh, listed, Cat5, Cat5e, Cat6. Um, Largely for the gear that we're working with, we often just uh, say use Cat5e, you know, and you'll be you'll be plenty good, you'll, you'll be safe. Uh, it's got a network speed that goes up to a gig. There are two speeds listed for each of those network speeds because they kind of auto negotiate to whatever the lower uh, equipment can handle. Uh, in other words, a gig speed piece of gear uh, will have to throttle back down to 100 uh, megabits if that's the kind of gear that it's uh, talking to. So they kind of negotiate that themselves. There's a factor here called crosstalk. And crosstalk is when one cable is next to another and can kind of interfere with another. Basically, they generate electric uh, EMI signals, kind of RF uh, signals between each other that can kind of generate noise on the cable. And that sometimes can slow down transmission and cause errors. So what these cables have is some various levels of, uh, of shielding and they get better and better as you get more uh, shielding in the cable. That's where you go from Cat5e to, to Cat6, extra, uh, extra shielding. Um, cable length is about 100 uh, meters, 300 feet plus uh, for each of these uh, before you need to go to another switch to do another switch hop. The next uh, slide, um, if you hear the term RJ45, that's just this physical description of this cable. This is an RJ45 connector. It's got uh, um, eight, eight, uh, eight pins. It's got four sets of uh, you know, usually twisted pairs uh, to run signal. Uh, like I said, you got to click this into the jack with that retention tab. Otherwise, your connections are a little bit squirrely. They're intermittent. Um, so this is the cable used for, for standard uh, Ethernet. I mentioned shielded RJ45, uh, and this is used to increase isolation from uh, electromagnetic or crosstalk in between uh, cables, or sometimes when you drape a cable across uh, some uh, uh, piece of gear, computer, or a DSP that's generating some sort of uh, interference field. So this is an advantage as far as that goes, but it's larger cable, a little bit more expensive, not as uh, flexible. Usually it's not required. Uh, I'll mention one case. Uh, our uh, discussion systems, discussion and conferencing systems do require this cable because that is, um, it's using Cat5 cables, but it isn't uh, Ethernet and we use shielding and the grounding in a special way. So usually these um, can just be Cat5 E cables. Uh, the next uh, slide talks a little bit about um, switches. Um, this is mostly the, the device that you'll be uh, working with to connect your network, to connect all your devices together. And what I want to mention here is that there is a big difference between the um, level of performance you get out of a consumer switch, uh, which is, you know, more often than not just made for home use where you might have, you know, 10 or 20 devices at the most, but not 100 and not 200. And that's where the professional level products start to uh, start to come in. Um, 
They've got a, a variety of uh, features in the professional products that uh, typically aren't available in the consumer products, uh, typically in the ways that you can get into the switch as the administrator and manage how you want that switch to behave when certain things happen. Uh, so for example, if you're the administrator of you know one of those more expensive switches, you can decide uh, and tell the switch what to do when somebody uh, joins your network that you haven't pre-authenticated. Um, um, you can actually do that with these switches. So you can say, okay, I know this is a, a switch that I want my crew to use and no one else. So I'm gonna pre-assign you know, authentication based on something, an IP address or a MAC address to let just your crew in, into that uh, switch uh, to gain access uh, to the equipment on that switch. When you're transporting these, I've uh, made the mistake a couple times of trying to shave off a couple minutes and transporting these without thoroughly unplugging all the cables. Um, and whenever those things get bumped or bent a little bit, uh, certain ports start to have, uh, you know, masking tape that I'm putting on them to say, okay, I can't use that port anymore. I bent that one. Uh, things like that. Um, they each have, um, in the more expensive uh, switches, power over Ethernet. <clears throat> um, and again, when the switch uh, gets mishandled or abused a little bit, some of those ports start to not provide the PoE that it's supposed to. Something gets uh, uh, broken. But in any case. Um, want to make mention of just going for a professional switch here just to not make this be the weakest link. You don't want to, you know, a, uh, you know, a fifty hundred thousand dollar show go down, you know, because you only spent a hundred bucks on what's like almost a disposable uh, switch. Maybe you can have that in your toolkit as a little emergency switch that you can, you know, use for some troubleshooting. Um, but don't make this the weakest link in your show. Um, Heat might be a factor in some of these uh, multi-port switches. Uh, you notice, um, I'm sure, whenever you see you know um, big racks of these uh, in a corporate enterprise, they put it in a nice room, a clean, you know, dust-free room, uh, air conditioned to let the switch have the most life it possibly can. So you don't want to generally have your switch be sandwiched in between like two, you know, hot amplifiers or something like that. Uh, that's going to reduce its its lifespan, basically. Another aspect of the, those professional switches is they've got real um, power cables instead of uh, um, you know external power supplies that, again, they're kind of a weak link. Those cables are pretty tiny. The little DC connectors can uh, just kind of walk right out of their connection and you lose you know the, the entire network for that. Uh, one last thing I see on the picture there for that, uh, one of those professional switches, I think that's a Cisco. 48 port is they've got what's uh, a port that you can actually connect into fiber. So I mentioned the length of cables is typically like 300 feet between uh, uh, between switch hops. Uh, fiber though, you can go considerably farther. And there's little uh, I'm trying to remember what they're what they're called. Joe, what are those little uh, fiber port uh, inserts called? Uh, uh, SFP. I forget the actual. Uh, yeah, yeah, SFP. Small, the, the small, SFP port. small form factor pluggable. These are little. Yeah little things that you can add into some of these switches when you have a long run in between certain uh, uh, lengths. Uh, all right, I think that's it for those for those uh, couple slides. Um, a couple more of the basic things that we wanted to go over are uh, what's a switch versus what's a what's a router and when you might uh, use one uh, versus another. Generally, we're using switches. Um, those are the devices that have, you know, a lot of ports on them uh, to make use of. Um, they forward data based on a, on a hardware address called a MAC address that Joel will explain uh, in a little bit. Um, you can use uh, the managed switch to kind of segregate networks into smaller ones. Um, generally, these move the data between uh, uh, switch, other switches and routers and uh, hosts. And um, the router itself is how to get to other networks, how to get to, for example, the internet or uh, other uh, other networks if you're on a bigger enterprise. Um, and that forwards data based on an IP address, and we'll get into IP addressing uh, momentarily. Um, ben, you want to add a little uh, color commentary for this topic? Yeah, just some things that kind of came to mind as uh, Doug was going over those. 
those first few slides there. I, I think it really is important to stress the layer one connectivity uh, when you're initially designing and, and setting up your network for the first time. You know, sometimes you'll plug in a cable and it might link, but you know, if you're not paying attention, it comes up at 100 meg instead of a gig, and that could be indicative of larger cabling problems or corrosion or you know, some something that's not allowing that switch to get the best connection possible. Um, and you know, some of the switches that we're working with, they have, um, you know, you can look at port counters on or error counters on ports um, to see if you know it, packets are getting um, corrupt or you know, if it's dropping packets or, you know, um, for any number of reasons. Um, so I think I just wanted to emphasize that, you know, ensuring that layer one connectivity at the base of building on all these other, you know, concepts and the protocols that we're going to talk about here is really important. Um, you know, and picking the right switch for the job. Um, you know, there's not one size fits all approach to specking network switches. You have to look at your application and, you know, um, what your, you know, the bulk of your network uh, applications may be and how you're going to um, be transporting them and the, the hardware that they need to interact with, you know. Um, sometimes a, a lower end um, switch might just be fine for control, but if you're trying to do any, you know, other protocols, then you're going to have to, um, you know, once you start dealing with the real-time stuff, you're going to really want something that allows you the, um, you know, the visibility into what's going on in the network. So I think that's important. Um, yeah, and I want to note that I also wrote, jotted down here real quick is um, on those um, switches that have the SFP ports on them for fiber uplinks, one of the gotchas to be careful with there as well is that sometimes those SFP ports are shared with RJ45 ports and one of them will take precedence over the other. You know, mm -hmm. So yeah. sometimes I've seen where people accidentally load up all the RJ45 ports and then they put a, a SFP in and it doesn't work or you know it messes with the traffic coming in on one of the uh you know one of the rj45 so those are some of the things we've seen there but yeah yeah super important to choose the right building blocks to um to implement these networks with yep yeah i totally agree that the uh, like for example the control network is probably going to be fine at 100 megabits per spec uh per second but typically um when we want to talk about dante networks we're always specifying to be gigabit yeah absolutely. Um, just to, it, it can work low ch lower channel counts at 100 meg but we just never want to go there and let that be uh, a problem as the network uh, scales up basically yeah, yeah absolutely you know uh, one of the things that has some truth behind it is that you know bandwidth is a form of quality of service you know in a way so uh you know, we'll get into that a little bit later in but yeah yeah you're absolutely right okay uh so uh, bandwidth is up here so we're not talking frequency response bandwidth we're talking a speed uh, speed at uh, which data can travel. So all, all networks are rated for, for certain speeds and when devices connect to each other, um, they basically go to the low uh, the, um, the lower of the two speeds. If one device is a, a hundred and the other is a gig, that gig device will have to back off to be a hundred. Um, I think you see this in some of the, um, like if you're in a Dante controller uh, window, you're looking at that, it'll tell you, I think, which links are gig speed links and which have come up uh, at 100 meg. Um, yeah, I think that's it for, for this. You can think about the bandwidth as, uh, you know, the size of a, you know, multi-lane highway versus single lane highway, how many, how many cars, you know, can get across or uh, analogy of um, a hose versus a, you know, a four inch pipe versus a, a huge pipe, you know, how much water can actually get through. So that's kind of how much data can basically get through. Uh, last thing to mention uh, in uh, this first intro uh, section is the uh, the transmission methods. So how does that little, uh, you know, blue device talk to those uh, red device and endpoints across a network? And there's a couple different uh, ways of getting from a sender to uh, a possible destination uh, going through a switch. So the first is unicast. And this is just talking from one device uh, to another device, um, you know, one by one. Dante audio flows typically are unicast. That's their default uh, setting. That's one of those things that I, I think IT administrators need to know, want to know, maybe assume the worst, um, because they are also always very reticent to allow um, multicast broadcast traffic on their network for fear of some sort of, uh, you know, network performance issue or, or broadcast storm or things like that. But Dante, uh, is uh, unicast by default. 
the next transmission method is multicasts, meaning one device is going to talk to many. So this is like, uh, you know, the equivalent of, uh, you know, me at the dinner table, if I'm talking to my family or, you know, one person uh, talks, a lot of people can listen, one sender sends, and a lot of uh, destinations can hear it. Those destinations kind of broadcast, uh, kind of announce to the network, hey, I want to be part of, you know, multicast, multicast group uh, XYZ. And the, the switch, if it's a, a smart enough managed switch, will kind of keep track of that. And it'll, it'll try to make sure that the multicast traffic that comes related to a multicast group XYZ only goes to the people, the destinations that have asked for it. So for example, Dante ClockSync goes to the devices that are asking for Dante ClockSync. It doesn't necessarily go to every single uh, device on the network. It goes to where it's needed to go. Uh, there can be some issues related to various switches and how they handle multicast. And I think that's one of the more common things that uh, Joel probably answers in system support group is why why do I have a uh, clock sync uh, instability? And Joel will probably dig into the uh, how the switch handles um, uh, multicast groups. I think you are going to get into maybe IGMP Right, Joel, in your section? Most likely, yes. In uh, topics two and three, I believe, uh, we'll yeah. talk about multicast and IGMP and how to traffic or manage multicast on a large, like, commingled network or something where you have a lot of video streams or a lot of just uh, multicast AES 67 uh, traffic. Okay. You can tell that this is uh, can be more efficient. You know, the sender only has to send it once and then the switch, you know, can get it to its destination. So it can be more efficient. And there, our ways of uh, using uh, multicast uh, with uh, Dante, <clears throat> um, you know, instead of its uh, default when you when you need to. Uh, the last is broadcast, meaning uh, something's going to get to every single destination within the network. Uh, in networking, there's this concept of a broadcast domain. Uh, broadcast domain is kind of like uh, anybody that can hear. Uh, you know, gets that that message. Like, uh, if I you know shout at the top of my lungs, my broadcast domain is probably my my house, first and second stories, but it doesn't extend to my neighbor's house. For example, that's my my broadcast domain. If I had a broadcast domain of displays, uh, my town where fifty six thousand people would hear me yell, that would probably be a an issue. Um, so hopefully that explains just a little bit of that and why IT managers are definitely reticent to have uh, broadcast uh, traffic on their network. The, um, the liabilities related to that, it can kind of uh, occasionally create a broadcast storm that is almost like a denial of service for the network. The network kind of goes down if there's that uh, type of traffic that's not managed uh, properly. Um, oftentimes, the IT manager will, will set up all their uh, network equipment to make sure that uh, that sort of broadcast storm uh, can't uh, can't happen. Um, two topologies to mention here, and, and one of which has a kind of an advantage over the other. The daisy chain topology is pretty convenient because I only have to buy like a little, in this case, you know, six inch little. Uh, uh, cable in between a bunch of receivers uh, to get all those networked together and that can be good but uh, you never know what happens when you you know this gets racked or re-racked and you lose a cable and unbeknownst to you that you know half of your receivers just dropped off your network from the ability to see them control them manage frequencies um, so that is something to consider when you're doing you know the daisy chain topology is that you might lose anything after what could be either a broken cable or something that's just slightly unseated from its uh, RJ45 connection. Uh, so instead, we are usually recommending a, a star topology. It's uh, less hops in between your uh, PC or Mac and any given destination, so that's one thing. But as well, if any of these single uh, connections goes down, you really only lose that one connection and you've still got more of your network that was not affected. Um, so that's what, what's called a star topology. So those, I think, are the network uh, basics that we wanted to make mention that, you know, are um, pretty important just to keep in mind, because if you start there, you can oftentimes uh, find uh, a problem 
you know, before it, it starts. And if you do have a problem, that's one of the first places uh, to look. So verify your cabling, uh, gigabit manage switches. You might not need all the management aspects on day one because that is like an entire career in and of itself is learning all the ins and outs mm -hmm. of, of what you can do to manage uh, switches. There are entire courses on this and you could spend the rest of your career learning. So that's a huge topic. Uh, you'll probably get into a couple of the basics though for access control and maybe VLANing on a switch. Those are some of the things that I think would be pretty common uh, for this group. Um, there's a disqualified switches list and this is disqualified not for because they they don't work at all but because they're not suitable for the purpose that we're trying to do for high quality high reliability uh, low latency uh, audio and video over a network so each manufacturer typically has some switches that they shy away from because they don't want customer issues uh, kind of look making their brand look bad when really if someone just you know spends a little bit more money on a switch they're going to be fine um the topologies I mentioned. Um, Jill, talk to us about the network FAQs. Indeed, yep. There are a number of FAQs on our website on sure.com, uh, I think forward slash FAQ, or if you go to any other manufacturer's website, um, they often have a number of uh, networking FAQs. So if you do want to learn a bit more on the best practices for say MXA910 or the best practices for Microflex Wireless or just networking um, multicast in general, there's also Dante, like IGMP, in-depth FAQs that we have written up um, specifically on certain topics. There's an FAQ on configuring the Cisco SG350 switch, the D-Link DGS switch. Uh, I know some other manufacturers with um, other FAQs specific to, um, to their hardware, but also working in the Dante or AES67 realm. Make sure you're taking a look at those FAQs, if not while you're there on the job previously or while you're doing training. Or any other webinars. We also have um, the Sure Audio Institute, which goes into some of the audio over IP um, basics, as well as configuration help for switches used with uh, Dante products from Sure. And also another um, thing I wanted to mention, I think we have a question that came in, what is the best tool for uh, CAT cable testing? Some basic, basic testers don't tell you much. Uh, the, the ones that we often use and that we've seen used in um, out there in the market are Fluke. The Fluke testers are fairly, um, they have a very large one that you can use for testing end-to-end -end capabilities. Uh, the cabling, testing the, the shielding, also if there's PoE uh, traversing over that cable, but also the twisted pairs, it will tell you if all of those pairs are functional and whether one is, is broken or, or split. Um, Fluke makes a fairly large one, but I also make a more handheld uh, tester that can, that can be used. A handheld tester we use um, on any of the switches, or sorry, any of the cabling that we use for DIS, since DIS is very particular on the type of cabling that's used, and that shielding is of utmost importance. So having some sort of, of tester like a Fluke tester would be beneficial. By the way, with cabling, real quick, um, I've made this mistake a couple times that I've come across a bad cable, and I haven't segregated or disposed of it properly and mm -hmm. lo and behold yep. i had the same problem the next time i went and didn't tell somebody oh don't use that you know 100 foot white one i had problems with that last time <laughs> i should just have a standard practice of if i've got a problem with the cable that's only you know you know 20 or 30 bucks at the most i'm gonna my i would say just throw it away unless you've got you know kind of a, a tool to repair it where it can be repaired but that's just one thing i'll throw out there is that these are cheap enough and important enough that uh, just throw it away if it's Indeed. if it's broken. I agree. And also another question on the FAQs that I was referring to. Those are, if you go to sure.com and either on our search um, icon at the very top, you can search for what you're looking for. Say if you want to know about Dante and IGMP in depth, there's an FAQ on that. Or if you just type Cisco SG uh, right there from the homepage from sure.com, um, certainly you can do a Google search for sure, you know, networking or sure and something specific and you'll go to an FAQ from us or of any other manufacturer that you're looking for specific knowledge on either how to configure a switch or the protocols that we um, like to adhere to. Dante as well, they have a number of, of networking questions and FAQs on their site. 
Yeah, I think one of the things I just want to add to the end of that section there is that, um, you know, being diligent with the topology as you're laying out and thinking about your networks, you know, before the show or before the tour or whatever it may be, um, I think that's important because you do want to eliminate the single points of failure where possible. Mm -hmm. um, and I think along with all of that um, labeling um, and organization of your cables is, is very important because you're oftentimes you're you know, you might be the one that designed and builds a system, but you're going to have stagehands plugging things in. You're going to have techs who aren't as familiar with the system as you. Um, so the importance of labeling your cables um, so that inadvertent connections, um, you can try to mitigate some of that, you know, from the start. I agree. But, Great point. Great. Yep. Okay. And uh, there we go. We'll move into topic two now, which will discuss IP addressing and also subnets. Um, let's go ahead and start. What is this stuff? This is the LCD screen of a, a ULXD receiver where you'll see something that says IP, um, sub meaning subnet mask, GW standing for gateway, and MAC address. And we'll dive into what each of those uh, terms means and, and how they sort of relate to each other. So what is an IP address? It's a device or a device has an IP address or a unique IP address when they're on the network. Uh, you can sort of make an analogy that the IP address is like the address of your house. Every house has a unique address. Every device on your network has a unique IP address. There are four octets within that IP address uh, that can range between zero and 255. Um, these can be managed or changed or configured either by you statically, you can set a static IP address, or you can set what's called um, you can set a device to be in DHCP mode where it will accept an IP address from a DHCP server, or there's what's called link local IP addresses, which we'll go into in the next few slides. But uh, be uh, mindful that some of these or majority of the uh, Sure devices that have Dante on them or support AES67 have dual IP addresses. That means there is an IP specifically for control, for like wireless workbench, for sending command strings using Crestron, and getting access to the web GUI, but there's also an IP address for the audio side. Um, specifically in our devices for the Dante chipset, there's an IP address for those Dante audio streams for clock syncing to talk with that chipset as well. So make sure that those IPs are unique uh, and that you have enough IPs available for your network. And uh, what we mean by a MAC address. MAC address, I consider to be sort of the serial number of your device. It is set at the factory. It's a unique identifier of a network device. Um, and typically, and I'll say for the example on Sure devices, there is an OUI or an organizationally unique identifier. So the first six digits of a Sure device will always have the number 000EDD. And when you're doing a network scan, you can quickly identify which devices are of Sure or which devices are of um, BIAMP or something by noting the OUI and then you can see um, what those devices are and where they are in your network. The last six digits are freely assigned by the manufacturer uh, on the board itself. So it's sort of like the serial number of any device. It can't change. Uh, you won't be able to change something like that, but it's um, useful when switches are populating their MAC address table and letting you know say this microphone is at this port on the switch because it has this MAC address and that MAC address is tied to the port. It's also utilized uh, occasionally in uh, when we're installing large systems in either government uh, locations or banking locations or uh, courtroom locations when there needs to be some sort of uh, added network security Mm -hmm. uh, typically, those clients are going to be asking us, give us a list of all of the device's MAC addresses, because then they plug them into this uh, configuration file that lives on each of their switches. And when their switch gets a message uh, that has a source of a MAC address that they don't know, that just gets blocked uh, when they receive it. Whereas if it's kind of on the whitelist, it's allowed through and gets to uh, a destination. So these do uh, these are made use of in uh, in switches in in enterprises anyway. Not mm -hmm. sure if they have as much uh, that you do with security at a uh, particular you know small uh, location. I've only run into them in kind of larger 
uh, corporations when they make use of them for security purposes, but they're also, mm -hmm. you know, used obviously for the Mac table that a switch uh, makes. Exactly. And a quick question on the OUI. Is there a, a table? We have a question that says, or is there a repository or a table or spreadsheet for these unique identifiers per company? Um, not that we have. Uh, there are OUI sort of lookup sites that are available online where you can search the OUI and it will tell you the company. Um, I know Cisco, they have a number of OUIs that they use as well, but there isn't that I know of a central repository that we maintain of OUIs used across the audio industry. But there are lookup tables that are online if you wanted to, to search for a specific one there. And uh, another note about Ethernet switches here, and we just briefly talked about how it builds a MAC address table. When any device is connected to that port and it starts you know, receiving, transmitting data, the switch will populate its MAC address table to know that a specific port uh, or a specific MAC address is connected to this port. So when traffic is sending from one device to another on this local switch, it will know, okay, I, I have a, a MAC address ending in 67. I know another device over there, 42, um, that I need to send information to is on port three. So in the switch itself, it knows how to forward data based on the MAC address and that table. Next, we'll get into what really is a subnet and what do we mean by the, sub, the subnet mask, sorry. Uh, the subnet subdivides a network into a range of IP addresses. I consider it being sort of the, the neighborhood in which your devices live on. It defines the size of your neighborhood it, based on the subnet mask. You can also limit problems. What we mean by problems are broadcast storms or, or multicast flooding, flooding to a specific neighborhood. If all of your devices were to live on the same sort of large subnet, all of those devices would, would see essentially the same multicast data or broadcast uh, packets flowing throughout that neighborhood. So a way to sort of organize things or subdivide either a conference room or a floor or even a building would be by creating these subnets. And you'll see further as we get along, I sort of um, switch between using the word subnet and VLAN. I like to um, use those interchangeably. And what is a subnet mask? It's, it's essentially like an IP address where it has four octets. Each of those octets typically uh, is either 255, zero, but there are also a number of uh, sort of increments in between that tell the, the IP address or the network how large that neighborhood is. And we'll go into sort of a few examples of what we mean by setting the subnet mask to define the size of your IP neighborhood. So as we're looking here, more in depth of what a subnet mask is, you'll notice that the last octet here is all zeros. In a subnet mask world, when you see something that says all zeros, that tells um, the neighborhood that any IP that changes in the last octet, but the first three octets are the same, those devices are in the same neighborhood. And we'll see it in this example with a 192.168 address. We have an IP of an IP address, say of a computer, that's 192.168.1.1. If we add another device, that is in the IP of 192.168.1.2, and they're both using that same subnet mask, that tells the devices in the network that every device in between zero to 255 on that last octet is in the same IP range. When, you're, when you see a 255 in the subnet mask, that means keep that number the same. Car carry, carry that number down. If we go to the third example, 192.168.1.3, that's also within the same subnet. But for instance, whenever we go to this IP and say you're configuring another um, switch or you're configuring another Dante system and you accidentally put in 192.168.2.4, yes, the first two octets are the same, but the subnet mask tells you this third octet must be the same across all of your devices to be in the same neighborhood. And when you have a zero there, zero means you can be any number in between that usable range, zero to 255. So when you have a two there, that lets the, or the two signifies to that device, I'm on the two subnet. 
or is anyone else? There's no one else in that subnet, and the other devices that are in the one, one subnet cannot communicate with it. And we'll see another example here when we have a subnet mask of 255.255.0.0, which signifies keep the first two octets the same, don't change those. The next two octets can be any number in between 0 to 255. It's especially useful, but you also see it very often in 169.254 addresses. These are what's uh, called link local or a PIPA or um, sort of self-assigned IP addresses. When there is no DHCP server in the environment, um, it will either look for DHCP if it doesn't have a static address, then eventually will fall back to what's called a link local address. In this case, you have one receiver or one computer that's at a 169.254 dot something, dot something. Anything else? Also in that range, 169, 254, dot something, dot something. They are all in the same neighborhood. It's a fairly large neighborhood. You have uh, uh, capabilities of what? 0 to 255, dot 0 to 255. So when you have another computer, different number of octet in the third and fourth octets, those are still within the same neighborhood. Let's take, for instance, you are assigning an IP statically and you put in 169.253 dot something dot something. As we saw from the previous example, that device would be on an island of its own. It, it may still be connected to a switch, um, but it's trying to communicate with other devices in the 169.253 range and it won't be able to do so successfully. And as we see here, this is a, a table that don't necessarily have to remember, but it's uh, good to know of and how subnet masks work. Uh, within the usual 255.255.255.0 subnet, you'll see that very often um, on networks, you have approximately 255 minus one because there's always a reserved IP uh, for broadcasting. You have that many hosts available to you. The bits, as the bits start to fill up in the subnet mask, the subnet mask number starts to increase, first by 128, then by 64, you add 64 on that, then it adds 32, then it adds another 16, and you'll see the numbers increment from 0, 128, 192. And a good rule of thumb that I like to use, when you see a weird subnet mask that has some, some uh, number that's not a 0 or 255, subtract 255 from that number, and you'll get the number of hosts that are available to you. So if you had, say, an I, a subnet mask of 255, 255.255.224, .255 subtract 255 from that 224, and you'll get the number of hosts that are approximately you would need, minus one for that reserved for, that reserve for broadcast. So it's uh, nothing that you need to remember, but it's good to know um, whenever you see something like that, that it is defining the number of hosts that are available to you in that neighborhood. So we had a quick question here about subnets. Um, it, subnet, typically I use subnets and VLANs yeah, interchangeably. You, I create a subnet by creating a VLAN. I create a small individual subnet, but if I um, have everything on the same VLAN, they're all on the same network or same subnet. And then another question we have here, what IP is the broadcast IP, which is reserved? And that's oftentimes the last IP in the range. So if you had a subnet mask, and we'll take the first one, 255.255.255.0, with an IP of the first example that we used, 192.168.1. whatever, typically you can have hosts of the IP 192.168.1 all the way to 254 where 255 is reserved for broadcasting. That's for sending out like requests, um, address resolution requests, uh, DHCP requests. It's reserved for sending out to all hosts within that subnet. So be careful. It's easy to get this wrong, especially when you're setting up static IP addresses on any of your devices. Um, I've done it plenty of times where you're, you're typing in IP addresses and you type in the subnet mask, I've typed in 255, 253, 255.0, not valid. And potentially, I mean, depending on the manufacturer, it will not allow you to do that, but sometimes you're able to 
to place those subnet masks into a static configuration. And then again, you won't be able to connect to that device or that device is gonna have some sort of connectivity problems. So just be careful when you're putting those in, especially if you're doing static IP addressing. Um, that is a, a good gotcha, I'll say. Yeah, Joel, one quick note on that. Um, yep. I, one of the things that I've seen in the past and something that's kind of interesting is there are specific applications that might, um, even for their control protocol, run over uh, broadcast only. For instance, mm -hmm. the, uh, the Dolby, the Lake controller, you know, what is the Lake controller now? Um, it used to operate purely on uh, broadcast packets. So even if your computer was in a different subnet or you, you know, fat fingered a subnet mask or something like that it would still work, but all the other applications on the network did not work because you're mm -hmm. actually not in the same range. So it is very important to to make sure you're paying attention to those those details. Yep. Yep, good point. Yep. And as we uh, go here, we'll sort of reiterate what we said about subnets. When you're dealing with a local network, typically one subnet, whether you're in a room or a set of rooms all living in the same IP range or in the same space. Um, these networks are often smaller. They're a self-contained network of gear. Sometimes you'll have a rack of gear and that's its own subnet, it's its own network. They're all within a given IP range using the subnet mask that you specify for that IP. Once you start to get into distributed networks, these are dealing with multiple multiple subnets or multiple VLANs. These are for mainly larger distributed networks of gear. If you're working in, say, an office environment with multiple floors, different VLANs, or um, even sometimes a floor can be subdivided into certain spaces, depending on IT security, if you have a, a VLAN for sales and then you have another VLAN for marketing. Um, you can sort of distribute networks into their own islands, and each can be sort of divided and organized in that way, either by room or by function. Um, this, though, when you're dealing with multiple subnets, this requires what's considered a layer three switch. You're no longer talking um, just within a local switch or talking MAC addresses, which is layer two. Once you start to route to other networks and other subnets, you're dealing in the layer three, which is the IP um, layer. You're, you're sending or forwarding packets from one subnet to another subnet in another, um, either another floor or another room or another building. So a layer three switch is needed for that or a router that can, can handle layer three uh, packet switching would be useful. So let's go get over to first gateway what we see as GW on some of our LCD screens. The gateway is the default gateway or router. Uh, that is useful when a device is trying to communicate to something in this layer three sense. It's trying to communicate to a device that's not on the same subnet. So if you have a, a 192.168.1 set of, of devices or gear, and you're trying to either control, say from a Crestron control panel, a device on a 192.168.2 address, each of your devices, in order to communicate somewhere else, need to have the gateway um, listed or specified. That gateway is pretty much the post office, essentially, where if I don't see a device in my local subnet, 192.168.1, I will send all of the information to my gateway. And the gateway knows of all of those other subnets. It knows of all of those other routes, and it will be able to forward that information from one subnet to another. So when devices basically don't know what to do with the traffic in their local switch or their local subnet, they are sending that information to their default gateway, the post office, which knows what to do with IP packets. Uh, briefly, an IP addressing here. How do I get an IP address? Either statically, that's a manual assignment you can do from either the web GUI, um, also in Dante controller, which gives you access to change IP addressing on the Dante side of things, um, where you can place IP, you can put in your subnet mask, default gateway, even DNS, or link local, where in the case of, of having a network that doesn't have a DHCP server, there's no one managing that network, or it's fully isolated from really everything else. Um, say you're, you, you have a rack at a show and that has switches, uh, wireless receivers and such, it may fall back or all of the devices may fall back to a link local address. That is a 169.254 address. And as long as they have the same subnet mask, 
255.255.0.0, .0, then all of those devices with a link local um, IP can communicate to each other. And it's perfectly fine to have link local IP addresses on a sort of small or self-contained network. Otherwise, uh, the last way to get an IP address would be DHCP. Um, in DHCP, I think uh, not this next slide, but in a few slides coming up, um, you're dealing with a DHCP server in which um, you discover that server. The server offers you an address. You request that specific address and you acknowledge. It's called the DORA process, essentially, of, of gaining an IP address automatically. All of that, the, the IP range, the subnet mask, and the gateway are all sent to you from that server. So why? Why would I assign static IP addresses over, um, say, a DHCP or link local? More so for specificity, if you are given a range to work within um, and you don't want those IPs to change at all, you want predictability, say if you have Crestron control panels and you want to send specific control or commands to NMXA 910 or you want to send commands specifically to um, another device and you don't want the IP to change, use a static IP. When you're dealing um, with DHCP, those addresses have a specific lease time and after that lease, your IP could change unless you're doing something more advanced like DHCP reservations, which always tells you I'm going to reserve this IP for this specific device. Um, using static, it's, it's great for documentation. Um, as I said, for control, for sending to a specific device that will never change. Um, also, because you have to, if you're working in an IT, uh, with an IT administrator or on a network where they say there is no DHCP server, you have to use these specific IP addresses, you would use static for that. The next, um, here is just a sort of little diagram on a DHCP and how it communicates or how a, a Dante product or any other network product communicates with a DHCP server. First, DHCP server, of course, has to be on. It notices or discovers that DHCP server. The server then offers an IP out to that device who is asking for an address, and then that address will acknowledge that IP once it has it. In the case of having DHCP server that is off, you, if it's off or there is no DHCP in your environment, that's when the, the host will look around the network. Are there any DHCP requests or is there a DHCP server in my environment? If there isn't, it'll wait. I forget the actual timeout for this, but it will wait until it falls back to a 169.254.something.something .something .something address with that subnet mask that says the first two octets need to be um, the same. The second two can be anything between 0 and 255. So yeah. Link local. Okay. Yeah, Joel, one thing I wanted to kind of add in there real quick and, um, you know, one of the things as well is you might have multiple assignment methods on the same VLAN. You know, you can mix static and DHCP um, depending on the type of devices that you need to accommodate. Um, you know, and it's, it's not always cut and dry. You kind of have to feel that out. Um, and it, it's interesting with DHCP too, um, some of these audio devices don't behave as well as others on the network in regards to these addressing and assignment methods. Um, you know, I've seen things where a device is set to, you know, it has, the, you can specify static or link local or DHCP. And even on link local, it might still be sending a DHCP discovers out to a server. I've had devices that have exhausted IP pools on DHCP servers. Um, because they're constantly sending DHCP discovers, but not actually using the address because they're set to link local. Um, so I've seen some, you've seen some bad behaving devices like that. So it's, you know, it, you know, it will get. I think we're going to get into some of the troubleshooting tools later. Um, but there are tools available to help you understand what a device is doing on the network, how it's looking for its address, or how it's, you know, the methods by which it's acquiring that address. Indeed. Yeah, I was going to bring that up uh, too and maybe ask you how you deal with that, Ben, because I think you mentioned that you use uh, a mix of those. Do you then uh, adjust the pool of addresses that you can hand out with your DHCP server so that you've kind of reserved, you know, this section of the IP space for its static addresses and then the DHCP only gives out the others? Because I was thinking if it gave out unbeknownst to it, you know, before this other one powered up, it might yeah. actually have an uh, address that you know was in your assignment already. 
Yeah, absolutely. There's there's certainly planning involved there to make sure that you know specifically the pool that your DHCP will be handing out and you know accommodating static IP addresses within that same subnet. So okay. you yeah, sure and you, you set those pools within either the the web UI or some command that you give your managed switch so that you kind of right. are aware what addresses it's uh, authorized to give out. And typically you only have one of those DHCP servers on your network because you don't need those fighting with each other. You can exactly. have two, but then you got to make sure they do not overlap in range. Yeah, this is actually a problem that we've talked quite a bit about internally because especially from the touring perspective, a lot of times the network or the you know the connection between racks or infrastructure isn't laid out when you power up the gear. So it's like I might have my delay tower out there that a, that a PA tech needs to test or get online, but I don't have a network link back to the stage where the DHCP server is. You know, so then you have to have the conversations like, do you have multiple DHCP servers with coordinated ranges? Um, you know, or if you don't, you know, one of the things that we test on a lot of our devices is if it's set to link local addressing because, you know, we want to be able to communicate it with that device as soon as it powers up, how long until it tries to DHCP for an address again, or how long, you know, what are the timeout periods and intervals involved there? Um, so it's it can get pretty complicated, um, but as long as you, you know, put together a plan and try to have an understanding of, you know, the methods by which your devices are getting IPs and kind of the structure that you've laid out for the show um, and some of the tools that we'll talk about later, you can kind of enforce um, that your devices are doing the right thing. Um, yeah, and uh, one of the other things, you know, along those lines is with DHCP servers and uh, Joel touched on the Mac OUI, which is the first um, part, the first half of your Mac address that identifies the manufacturer. Um, in very specific use cases, what we've done um, certain DHCP servers allow you to get pretty granular with leases. So you can say MAC addresses with this OUI, here's your pool. And then MAC addresses with this OUI, here's your pool. Um, you know, that's been some special cases, but there are things like that that can be done as well. Perfect. Yeah, great point. And um, this here for the next slide, as we talk about open ports and protocols, this is nothing you really have to remember. It's just uh, knowing the, the idea behind this. If you have, say, your house, for example, with an address or a host with an IP address, um, you can bring data to that device. But every house, much like every device, has a, a window or a door where you can send data through. So that's basically what the ports and protocols are. In this sheet here, which is also available on our website, but if you um, even search for IP ports and protocols for a number of our products, we list which ports or which windows and doors uh, the data will come into our host through. Um, there are some for discovery. There are other ports for device control. Um, so it's, it's good to know if you are having any issues with, say, getting to the web browser of a Flash-based device, or sorry about that, of a device, um, you may notice that port 8180 may have been blocked on your network. But just um, knowing what this means and what we mean by port, uh, this is exactly what that is. Um, some ports may be blocked on the network or filtered or um, blocked on the firewall. So uh, make sure that these ports are open. And then uh, we have another slide here on what is a VLAN? A virtual local area network, or essentially where you're, you're creating a virtual LAN or local area network on a switch or one piece of, uh, of hardware. Um, essentially making this, making this switch act as um, two separate devices or two separate switches. In the example of, say, this switch, you have VLAN 10 for ports 1 through 24, and you have VLAN 20 for ports 25 through 48. VLAN 10 could be configured as the IP address of 192.168.1. something, and then VLAN 20 would have the IP address or the range of 192.168.2. something. And that's essentially what we mean by, by um, isolation or VLAN or, or subnet isolation of devices. You can set up separate sort of local area networks depending on um, how you configure the switch. In a layer two switch, you won't be able to route between those VLANs. So VLAN 10 will not be able to talk to devices that are operating in VLAN 20. But if you're using a layer three switch or a router, that is what will give you the capability to navigate to other subnets or to, to other 
VLANs. In this audio VLAN example, we have, say, um, QSC, we have a number of DSPs, so everything in the yellow, for example. We have Dante device. Everything is living on a VLAN. We'll call this VLAN 1, and that takes up ports 1, 2, and 3. You can also set this switch, given it's a managed switch, you can set a number of other VLANs for the other ports, where for the, for the devices that connect through the yellow ports, they're all communicating with each other. VLANs or devices that are on the red VLAN will communicate with each other and see each other, and that will sort of isolate them to this group of gear, or you can isolate the VLAN to a specific floor or um, by any function. So as we get to the, to the end of this topic, um, we'll go into summary first and some of the best practices that I've seen and, and have dealt with over the years. First, when you're going into an implementation or commissioning a new system, you want to calculate the number of IPs. As I mentioned, some devices may have two IPs. Sometimes a device may have two or three. Um, I know Axiom Digital Receivers, you can do control, you can do redundant Dante audio networks, so you'll have three IP addresses there if you want to do Dante redundancy and things. Calculate the number of IPs uh, that you're going to have on your network just to make sure um, what you're going into your neighborhood is large enough to handle all of that gear. Otherwise, we can work with your IT administrator or network engineer to change the subnet size. Also, also isolate uh, AV equipment on a specific VLAN. Even though Dante um, can be commingled, it can work with existing um, architecture, it can be mixed, say, in a corporate environment, it's always best practice to isolate all of your AV devices onto its own VLAN, not just for network security, but also for efficiency of the network. You don't want all of the, the packets, multicast packets and, and unicast to go over the same network as like video streams and printing and other sort of corporate um, corporate network uh, packets and, and information. You don't want that to be all on the same network just for an efficiency sake. So isolating all of your AV equipment onto its own VLAN is beneficial, but even if you're commissioning a, a new system or going into an existing environment, document um, document your network topology. It's very useful to get them to get to know the lay of the land whenever you're um, building out or scaling up a design. You want to know exactly what you're talking to, what's on the other side of the switch, if there are multiple switches and routers. Uh, you want to know that there's you know, Crestron NVX video stream devices on another switch that you're connected to because that's going to be a lot of traffic. And if you don't know what's coming into your environment or sort of the network topology, it can be um, hard to troubleshoot, especially if you're working with a manufacturer and they, they want to know why a device is falling offline or if there's just a lot of multicast or something. Having that lay of the land either um, by your documentation or the IT or the network engineer you're working with. Next is to use static for third-party control. Uh, if you're doing a Crestron control panel or any other Extron AMX, it's useful to place everything onto a static range. I work with a number of integrators um, every day, and sometimes you'll run into a case where they set DHCP for a receiver or some other mixer, and they're trying to send control to it. It'll work for you know a week, a month even, based on that DHCP lease. But as soon as that lease is up and potentially the, the um, IP renews and another IP is assigned to that device, then your programming is broken. So setting static for third-party control is always a great best practice. Or you can use DHCP for ease of setup. If, it, if you have a fairly small network, you're, doing, you're not doing a lot of control and you just want to uh, have a plug and play environment, you really don't care what IP address is assigned to each device, DHCP is very useful for that. Um, it's, it's also useful for further uh, troubleshooting and maintenance if you have another engineer and other tech going on site and they need to get connected to the network very quickly, they can plug into a computer, or sorry, they can plug into a network jack on a switch, pick up an IP address from that DHCP server and discover any of the devices um, in that network. We have a few other questions here as well, uh, more so on IP addressing and formatting. Um, in the IP space, there are different classes of IPs. Um, there's class a, class B, and class C. We didn't really get into it in this discussion. Um, in a class A IP address, I think it can range from 1 to 126 in the first octet, where um, 
class B, you'll often see 172 addresses. In class C, you'll often see 192 dot something addresses. As you go down a certain number of, of classes, class A, you can have a large amount of subnets. So if you need thousands of subnets, so thousands of VLANs, because you have thousands of offices or groups, you can use a class A or it can be used for ISPs and such. When you don't that need that many subnets, um, more so hosts or you don't expect to have a very large growing uh, network, class B, like 172 addresses or uh, class C, 192, range would be beneficial that's totally fine um 169.254 addresses they're sort of not necessarily class of their own but we don't see those often used in routing uh, networks so 169 you wouldn't use with say a 172 address or a 192 address they are sort of a link local these devices are living on their own private island they don't really route anywhere uh, they're all living on the same switch so. Yeah, and as a note on that too, those um, those classes that Joel's talking about, they uh, map directly to uh, subnet masks as well, and that's what determines how many subnets you can derive from those from those classes. It would be, you know, slash eight, um, slash twelve, and slash sixteen. Or, yep. you know, or yeah, and there's bit. different uh, different philosophies, I guess, that companies kind of decide to land somewhere on the spectrum. Some mm -hmm. like to have uh, a lot of control over just limiting problems to just you know a couple dozen or a few hundred devices, and so they have more subnets. Some other uh, places, maybe like a university, wants to have a huge uh, network where it's really easy for you know uh, students to reach whatever network they they want to, for example. So each of the IT administrators responsible for their organization their enterprise their uh they'll determine kind of how big uh they want to go with uh with subnets but generally that's that's the strategy it's a, it's a way to help you can contain problems to within a certain group of addresses if any problems occur indeed yep yeah and I, I see just to kind of tie into that real quick i see there was a question um about avoiding a subnet mask like 255.255.252.0 um so that comes into play. We just talked about network class cl uh, classes, but then you know, in recent years, well, yeah, it's been been around for a little bit, but we have this notion of a uh, classless interdomain routing, and that's what allows you to get uh, specify subnet masks that are outside of either the slash eight or the slash uh, twelve or the slash sixteen that are specified by those classes. Mm -hmm. So the question um, that we have here is. Um, would a network admin hate seeing something like that? Um, no, the answer is no, not necessarily, um, because uh, uh, CIDR, as it's often referred to, uh, classless interdomain routing, um, is very common these days. Um, so that would not be a foreign concept to to most IT departments, and they should be fine with that. But it does require coordination, um, you know, with with those departments. Indeed. Yeah. For example, if they're just routing uh, or connecting two routers, that's where they would sometimes use a very tiny uh, yeah. subnet of just two or four address uh, spaces as a strategy of not using up uh, an entire you know network that could have been 254 devices. They don't need that if they're just connecting one router to another. They're only going to need an address space of just those two addresses. So that's one example of why they might use such a small subnet. Exactly. Exactly. And one quick note about uh, link local addresses. Um, you certainly can specify. I, I don't recommend sort of specifying your own link local IP address. Um, they will often they will fall back to their own link local 169.254.random.random. And when they do that, they will automatically discover other devices that are in that same sort of IP space. It's nothing you normally have to manually put in. Um, Sometimes I do it because I'm impatient on my computer. If I want to see a rack of gear and I have some static IP assigned from another job, I'll place a 169.254.random.random in there with the correct subnet mask and I'll be able to discover those devices. But it's nothing you, you need to normally set statically yourself. I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah, yeah I see in relation to that as well, there was also a question about um, link local devices um do they just go in sequence or is there a um you know a method behind that and it, it really is well you know for the intents and purposes what we're talking here ipv4 and ipv4 it really is just random 
randomly picks um, the last two octets, um, but it'll also verify that it uses ARP or address resolution protocol to send mm -hmm. the packet onto the network and see if any devices currently have that. And if they do receive a valid ARP response, then they'll try a different one. And that can be, you know, it, that's one of the reasons why it takes a little bit longer sometimes is because of that process to verify that the IP address is not already in use. Yeah. There we go. And I'll answer one other question here. We have, so if, an, if a hotel blocks ports 5353 and 8427, will Dante shut down or would it just block devices being discovered by a controller? Um, depending on the port that's blocked, if it is a port for discovery, you will not be able to discover those devices. If it's been routed previously before from one device to another, Dante audio will still pass but there are certain ports like the discovery port that you won't see a device in Dante controller. Um, there are certain ports for precision time protocol like syncing. If that is blocked, then um, the Dante devices won't be able to sync with each other. In that case, you may see muting of Dante audio. Um, so it really depends on the port, which one is blocked by IT, but making sure all of those ports that we use across these devices are open um, is a great, great practice. Uh, also give that list of open ports and protocols depending on the product um, to an IT admin if they need that. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to add one quick thing to that. While it is possible and it is often a problem, you know, that uh, a house IT, in this case the hotel, blocks specific ports within a VLAN or in a switching infrastructure, a lot of times these port blocks come at routed boundaries at layer three because mm -hmm. um, that's what it's a lot easier. Well, in the scheme of things it's easier to block ports on those routed boundaries where you're dealing with ip addresses than it is on the switch itself so Indeed. just you know sometimes um there can be some confusion there when talking to um you know when interacting with house it departments just to make sure you're on the same page with those kind of things got it yep uh i guess we'll move along here to topic number three i think doug did you want to go over that uh, networking your computer There we go. That'll that'll always help. Um, so some considerations for uh, net, networking your computer is uh, whether you're going to connect to just a single uh, device versus a network of devices. Um, because if I'm just going to uh, maybe just troubleshoot and look into the firmware of a particular piece of gear, I really only you know need maybe my spare uh, PoE switch uh, that I have handy or possibly a, a, a PoE injector, because sometimes if it's like one of our uh, DSPs or array mics uh, that needs to be powered and my PC can't power it, so I gotta have a, a, a PoE injector, um, which by the way, there there are, um, I believe, um, uh, standard versus gigabit uh, PoE injectors. So if you are gonna have one of those in your toolkit, um, make sure to kind of read the fine print, uh, spend just a little bit little bit more money to get a gigabit uh, PoE injector. I think there can be connectivity problems if you're trying to connect with a, uh, you know, some of our Dante devices uh, just with a standard uh, fast e ethernet uh, power injector. Um, so considerations when uh, connecting to a network of devices include all those addressing attributes that we've been uh, talking about, as well as is this just uh, a standalone network that we brought into a certain room that doesn't connect to the corporate network versus you know, literally plugging into a corporate enterprise uh, network? So real quickly, just to orient you on what those are, um, we've got an example here of a local network that's basically your own rack of uh, gear, your, your DSPs and receivers. Um, actually, flip to the next slide, uh, Joel. The one that with um, just a, a rack full of uh, gear that becomes its own small network. So you're just gonna your own rig for for touring. Possibly, um, you know, the rack you've got, you know, uh, backstage for a small inst installation or house of worship. Um, this type of network really benefits from the uh, automatic discovery because it's just a small network. You can kind of discover all the devices in it. Um, Oh, back up to that one. So one thing I wanted to draw out here is um, like any network changes during a live event, I would really think twice before uh, before doing that. 
In other words, if if you, if the event is going on, that's when I'm really nervous about adding another piece of network gear, uh, unless I really know what's going on. I might want to power it up uh, separately to make sure I know it's on a compatible IP address. I might want to make sure that uh, if it's a Dante device, that I uh, power it up um, after I've connected it into this network, so that I don't bring up two separate Dante networks that are in two separate, you know, clock uh, domains effectively, and then all of a sudden, while you know music is happening, try to make them merge. That that kind of makes me nervous. So that's just kind of some some gotchas there. So these smaller networks will be when you've got you know a couple dozen devices, you know, maybe a hundred. Typically, the address space that you've got to work with, you know, in a network like the 192, 168, one network is only, you know, you just, you're working with a couple, maybe 100 to 200 devices at, at, at the most, typically only a couple dozen. Um, when you've got, uh, you know, 500 plus devices in the same network, that's where you've got to start managing your network traffic uh, more. You got to take some caution. Uh, one example that comes to mind is uh, we had a relatively large network. I think it maybe had 300 um, devices, at least 300 sure devices, but there were other devices from other brands on this particular network. And um, the problem that we had to deal with in kind of an enterprise network uh, environment is there was so much uh, kind of a chatty keep alive and uh, hello uh, you know, type of traffic on that when the device, uh, when the whole network powered up at first, it would basically talk itself to death upon power up. Um, so as an example of why you'd need a, a, a managed switch, what we had to do with that end customer is just go into their uh, switch configurations on each floor and limit the, um, the, the, uh, the kind of the keep alives or hellos to each floor because they were powering up like 17 floors at the same time and all of the IP cameras and all of the wireless devices were all saying hello at the same time and it just uh, wasn't a happy situation. So these enterprise networks, you know, they require some router setup, some conversations with uh, IT departments. You definitely will be sometimes frustrated with how many people have to be involved and have to know what's going on and they all have different fiefdoms and opinions on how to do things and what you can and can't touch. Um, when you go into these you know, facilities and campuses and, and uh, places, you do have to be careful about just going ahead and plugging in and kind of uh, you know, tossing the dice, so to speak, because you might very well just shut down the port that you're trying to, to work with if the uh, client has already set up that port. Uh, to have some sort of network security on it, where if it doesn't recognize your computer, it's going to shut down uh, that port. And now it's going to have to be a, even a, an elevated conversation with whoever the IT security manager is uh, for that particular venue. So a lot of policies, a lot of security things, uh, a lot more instances of blocked uh, ports. Um, we use the word port, and I should use the kind of distinguish port from interface, because I often say, oh, this is a 24 port switch. It's a 48 port switch. Uh, but the ports that I'm mentioning that could be closed are more um, the, the logical ports that are kind of uh, embedded within the ad addressing scheme. It'll send you know, messages to a particular IP address. And within that IP address, as Joel was kind of describing it, OK, the IP address might be the house, but the port is like, is it the front door, the back door, the side window, you know, through the, you know, the chimney? What port is it using to, to get into that particular device? So hopefully that gives a little flavor for, uh, I don't know, this, the topics around around this. As well, there, there might be um, enterprise monitoring software that you get into with an enterprise uh, network. And that also requires um, a lot of uh, brands' equipment to be talking up to one single pane of glass so that an IT administrator has a, a really good knowledge of everything that's on, on their network. Um, so real quick on your computer's IP address, a lot of you have probably uh, uh, found this already and set this numerous times, but you find it by going to your control panel, into your system preferences. Um, you can type in your search, uh, you know, just CMD to get to your command uh, prompt app, a little, you know, dark uh, screen, will pop up and show a bunch of things. Um, 
in on Mac, IF config, on Windows, IP config, it'll show your IPv4 address, which is typically what we're we're dealing with. It'll show your subnet uh, mask. It'll show your default gateway, or if you don't uh, have one. Um, and um, yeah, there's you can change this if and when you need to. Um, typically, when I do, uh, I regret it about you know a couple of days later when I'm trying to get on a network and I've forgotten that I've set a static address that I've not put back on uh, into automatic. Some best practices when you're setting up networks is uh, think about how many switch hops you're going to need. In other words, if you've got the chance to use uh, one main switch and star from that to your locations, that's probably better than having one, you know, uh, you know, hop, go to the next, go to the next. So you've got, you know, three, four, five hops in between destinations. If you have to, you know, it can work, you know, a gig, gigabit network for a handful of hops, um, but just something to watch out. Keep a uh, PoE injector so that you've got the ability to maybe troubleshoot some of the gear that needs a uh, uh, PoE um, or keep a spare PoE switch. Um, that's where maybe you can, you know, keep one of the cheap ones for, you know, $200 just uh, handy uh, and take care of it and just use it when and if you need to do some troubleshooting because it's quite portable. Um, and as well, you know, a spare USB dongle because my machine, it doesn't even have an Ethernet jack. Uh, I have to use either USB or some uh, special network plug. And I usually do have uh, a spare because of just concern about one getting uh lost or, or broken uh, and that's my only access to the network so i want to have a spare indeed I'll, i'd like to add as well on the poe side um keeping a poe injector with you it's a great for troubleshooting especially if you have a um, a device uh, like an mxa 910 where it either doesn't power on or it's not sending traffic uh, throughout the network as you'd like or there's issues with firmware updating devices uh, one thing that's very useful is directly connecting that device to your computer using a PoE injector. So you can send power and data um, to this PoE device, but then directly connect it to your PC. See if it powers on. You can run firmware updates that way. You can log into the web GUI. Um, each of our devices, I see a question about uh, PoE wattage. Um, each of our devices specified in the, the manual um, is either should be class zero PoE, except for some specific ones like the p300 which is our small dsp that takes poe plus i think standard class zero poe if i'm not mistaken uh is about 15 watts or it'll auto yeah it'll auto negotiate up to about 15 watts before mm -hmm. then needing to be poe plus to go up to what 30. i think so yeah and with uh poe plus uh, the p300 will power on using a standard poe switch it's when you start to get into those more heavy dsp processes that the uh, device won't uh, perform as well or it will stop working all of a sudden when you're trying to do more dsp processing heavy things and you have something a poe plus device connected to a poe switch it may power on but it it won't be used to the best of its ability um and also yeah, keeping and the switch... cable length to deal with as well there in other words uh, a, a foot of cable is going to be different at the end of that than uh 300 feet of cable Mm -hmm. And um, also for keeping the switch hops low, uh, in the Dante realm, the more switches or the more hops between switches you have in your network, uh, the more latency you're introducing. So I think they've defined it as for every switch hop, you're adding a millisecond of latency in the Dante realm. Um, but it's, it's very useful for um, sort of narrowing down the points of failure in your network just to keep the number of switches minimal or when you are uh, networking or documenting your topology, if you're in a larger corporate network, um, ask the IT administrator or network engineer, um, where are we going or how many switches are we going through before we get to a device that's going to be the Dante master? Because you're inter introducing a bit more latency when you're going across multiple switch hops. Yeah, so like to move it along here. We'll talk about topic four. We're gonna get more so in the Dante side into Dante and AES 67 here, uh, talking more so about the history uh, first of Dante on this first slide um, created by a group called Audinate. Um, previously, I believe there are a number of engineers from Motorola uh, back in the day that started introducing something like this and, and, and started to work with Audinate on it, I think it's the early 2000s. Um, this protocol 
you can use their chipset to send audio bidirectionally up to 1,024 channels, depending on the chipset that you're using. Um, it's great for sending uncompressed audio over Ethernet and 24-bit 48K resolution. It's a low latency, plug and play. It can work on shared networks, be that a, a, an existing corporate environment, or if you're building out a network, you don't have to buy any special cabling. Um, switches have to do in play. You don't want to use any consumer grade switches as we discussed earlier, but other, other network traffic and this audio Dante traffic can work um, or can coexist together in the same um, architecture or on the same switch. Granted, you have something that uh, has enough throughput for that. Uh, sending a thousand channels bi-directionally over one ethernet cable. I think that's why this standard has proliferated throughout the, the AV industry as being something that's very easy to use and handy. It's I use it even here in my apartment where I can send audio from um, one mixer that I have to the other side of the space using one Ethernet cable that I already had run. Instead of running, you know, three or four XLR cables, we can just do all of this over an existing architecture. AES67, their implementation is what we use in any of our Dante products. It's an interoperability standard which can communicate with Dante but with other audio over IP uh, standards. So it's what's considered an interoperability standard. Um, I like to make the analogy where Dante is like Microsoft Word. Uh, you have other manufacturers and protocols out there of audio over IP. AES67 is like the .txt, where Dante can communicate over a text version of a file. And also these other protocols can communicate also through this AES67 or standard interop interoperability standard. But it's the one difference between AES67 and Dante is that Dante is unicast by default, but AES67 is multicast by default. And we'll discuss more of the impl implications of using AES67 uh, versus Dante. The special considerations for Dante typically want to see gigabit switches. You certainly can use a 10100 switch and I think it's been stated in the Dante um, cert certification classes, 10100 can be used. But for the, the inexpensiveness and for so many gigabit switches that are out there in the world, we typically say to stay in the gigabit realm. You don't want to throttle your network you know, down to a 10100 level when you could have just used a, a gigabit switch. And most networks nowadays are gigabit uh, anyway, uh, using Cat5e or Cat6 cabling. So keeping that up and future-proofing the network, make sure everything is gigabit. Uh, manage switches when at all possible. That way you can turn off things like uh, energy efficient ethernet, which is detrimental to Dante audio routes. It can cause glitches, pops, it can cause Dante audio to disappear. Um, you could manage QoS settings, which is a packet prioritization, where you can set strict priority queues for uh, timing for Dante clock syncing timing, and also for Dante Audio. A number of these gigabit managed switches also incorporate power over Ethernet for powering your, your devices, but also um, gives you some access control where you can set MAC address filtering or MAC security on a specific port on that switch. So that's why we recommend gigabit managed switches. Um, unmanaged switches can be useful for sort of troubleshooting, but um, maybe for a small, sort of local rack uh, setup, I would recommend, or we typically recommend managed switches because on an unmanaged switch that has EEE or has some other multicast filtering in place, you can't do anything about it because it's unmanaged. You can't log into the command line interface or the web interface. Another consideration uh, for Dante are the routes. The, the name of the device in Dante controller is sort of is what is kept and that's how routes are kept between devices it's by it's dependent on their name the ip address can change whether mm -hmm. that's static or dhcp uh, the ip address can change but the route will still stay there as long as the dante name is the same um, one instance for example i've seen this useful is if you have um one sure receiver sending audio to a dsp for some reason that receiver fails or goes down, you can essentially name a new receiver, the same name as the old one, put it into your rack, and then those Dante audio routes will still keep. 
uh, the same for any of our audio network interfaces. If you keep the name the same, um, you can swap out devices. If you were to change the name of a Dante device, that audio route will disappear or disconnect. And you'll see sort of a red, not a red, but a yellow triangle with an asterisk that said, I used to be connected to something with this name, but now it's gone. So move along here to a number of facts, a few facts on Dante, um, especially when you're working on gigabit links. They don't need to be on their own network. Uh, they don't use broadcast transmission as well. And, and since they won't slow down the network, especially if you're using gigabit links, um, the bandwidth for four channels of uh, Dante setup is typically around 0.6% of a gigabit network. As you start to scale up to 16 channels or even 64 channels, um, you're not using that much bandwidth when you're working on a gigabit network. On a 10-100 network, as you get up to 64 channels, you have totally saturated that network, which is why we totally recommend being on, on gigabit. And this discussion here, we've had uh, with a number of, of integrators and why you should use one versus the other. Uh, Partly, it depends on the DSP limitation. I know some uh, DSPs, uh, like QSC's Core 110, where they only support AES 67, you will have to use a Dante device or something that supports AES 67 to communicate with it. Once you're you're starting to deal with other um, audio over IP protocols, uh, Livewire, Ravenna, they may not talk Dante, but they all talk AES 67. So that is another reason why you could use one over the other. If you're dealing with multiple protocols of audio over IP, they can all talk the shared interoperability standard. The one problem uh, that we see mainly with AES67 is multicast. Since it's multicast by default, and you're, if you're running everything on the same VLAN, um, there could be flooding of this multicast to all ports on the network. We have a few protocols that we'll talk about next on how to mitigate that, but all vendors, no matter if you're sure, Yamaha, QSC, all vendors should be aware of the problem that multicast should be handled with care. Um, you have Dante, which is unicast by default. Unicast is just a one-to-one -one communication between a sort of receiver and a transmitter. In the AES67 realm, you're sending out Initially, multicast can be sent out like broadcast. It will flood the network to see who wants to listen to this multicast data. If you don't handle it, we've seen issues where sort of Crestron control panels, wireless access points, um, sometimes receivers, they'll just fall offline because if you're doing video streams or if you're working with a lot of AES67 products and they're all spitting out this one-to-many packet uh, to all of your devices on the network, it can flood or shut down other ports of, of devices that really can't handle it. They all have to say no to these packets. Um, I consider it like a magazine subscription. If, if one device, it doesn't really care to see AES 67 and multicast is going all over the place, it may have a hard time sort of saying no to all of those things. So uh, making sure you're aware of, of multicast, how it's used on the network, but introducing some other protocols that we'll see in the next slides here, uh, you can, can uh, fix some of those problems and make your network a bit more efficient. Uh, Control and Dante can share the same VLAN. Uh, if you're sending, say, Yamaha control between a receiver and a, and a Yamaha mixer, that Dante audio control can live on the same VLAN. As we get more into the, the switch configuration, uh, we'll discuss what IGMP is. IGMP snooping, it's really used to limit uh, multicast data only to the ports that need it. If IGMP is enabled on a managed switch, uh, that IGMP protocol sort of has a querier and that querier will ask, hey, who wants to see all of the multicast data on this network? We have a magazine. Who wants to subscribe to this magazine? Otherwise, multicast can flood the network sort of like broadcast does if you don't have a way to, to traffic it or make it more efficient. Um, it, be, it can become a problem when traffic is a bit more significant. If you have video streams, as I said, or if you're dealing with a lot of, of MXA 910s that are all talking in AES 67, 
that traffic can start to um, cause problems with other devices. I've seen yeah, wireless access points fall offline, control panels fall offline. The switch itself can act as the courier. There should be one courier on every subnet or on every VLAN. A courier is essentially asking who or which ports want to see the multicast data. Otherwise, I won't send this data to ports that don't need it. It's a great way of sort of trafficking all of that multicast. And more for IGMP, for simple configurations, it's, it's okay to disable IGMP snooping, and it should most likely be disabled on any switch you have from the factory. Um, it's useful if the network is known, if it's static or it's not managed by an IT staff. If you have a rack of gear and a, a small rack for show, you really don't need to worry about IGMP snooping, uh, especially if there's a high data rate of multicast traffic or video streams going across this network. Uh, useful if you have a, a dedicated AV only network, you can disable something like IGMP snooping. Otherwise, if you are going to use this protocol to traffic AES67 or sort of cut down on the, on the ports that are seeing multicast, make sure it's configured properly. If it's not, you can run into issues where um, if there's not a courier set, you'll have something that's not asking the network or it's not asking anyone who wants to see the multicast data, who wants to see the subscription. In that case, it could block all multicast traffic. And in those cases, you won't see the AES67 tab in Dante controller, or you won't see AES67 streams in your QSC core. So work with your IT to configure the switch or also consult the manufacturer for switch setup. Briefly, we'll go for QoS, uh, quality of service. It's useful for, for loaded or heavily loaded networks if you have a lot of, sort of commingled data and you want to prioritize certain packets. Also useful for, for slow 10-100 networks. It's a packet prior, prioritization tool that is used to set specific queues and set tags to say the precision time protocol clocking data must be the first highest priority. Next will be audio, that is the next highest priority and so on. Those uh, Dante packets contain these QoS tags and anything with the higher priority tag will be sent to the front of the line. So as you may know, um, I don't know if anyone has taken these, but we have a, a number of Dante certifications or Audinate actually has the Dante certifications, level one, two, and three. If you haven't taken these already, they're um, uh, great learning resource, all of Dante's certifications, as well as the Sure Audio Institute. We we offer a number of certifications for information systems, even wireless, um, conferencing, and things like that. So if you haven't already, be sure to take the audinate.com uh, slash learning and, and get your certifications in Dante. So lastly, on the best practices slide here, um, some of the best practices we've seen in the AES67 and, uh, sorry, in the Dante realm are keeping or recognizing the usefulness or the need for security in your Dante network. Between Sure devices, we have uh, AES256 encryption. It's a Sure audio encryption between MXAs, P300, and also ANI audio network interfaces. You can set a user-defined passphrase for this uh, encryption, but also it's it's good to set a password for any web GUI that you have uh, on any of your, your Sure devices or any manufacturer device. Also, make sure to isolate, if you can, the network, either by its own AV VLAN or an air gap. If you don't need to be connected to the corporate network at all, make sure that there is no uplink to the corporate network. Also, make sure to lock down or work with the IT administrator to lock down open, open Ethernet ports. Dante on its own, uh, with Dante controller, if you have a computer running Dante controller, you may be able to view all of those Dante devices on the network, but also route audio as you wish. Uh, so if someone has a computer and there's an open jack that connects to the AV VLAN, make sure either that port is shut down or that there's MAC address restrictions or some VLAN restrictions that says only these specific MAC addresses can connect to this VLAN. Um, Dante, as I said itself, you can potentially snoop those packets unless you're using something like encryption or an air grab or some type of restriction on the MAC addresses that can talk on that VLAN. 
for further way, information John, oh yeah continue uh, for those locking down open ethernet jacks just to be uh, clear on this this is not uh, talking about any sort of uh, physical um, uh, lock it's uh, it's something that you do either through the user interface or a command line to your managed switch that says uh, you know this this physical port is shut down and that you know whether or not someone plugs into it doesn't doesn't matter the port is pr pretty much dead a lot of times you go into corporate spaces and if there's uh you know a, a physically uh open ethernet jack on the wall you plug into it it's it's dead because somebody back at the you know uh it desk has uh logically shut down a port and you have to request oh can you open up this you know port number you know the jack number such and such on this wall and they'll open it up so that's how they handle kind of security at the at the corporate level but you'd have that same mm -hmm. opportunity if you actually had your own kind of managed uh switch that you got familiar with what you could do yep exactly and there's a link there at the bottom there uh or you can even search sure best practices for audio security and it has a nice write-up uh, mentioning these steps as well there's also other networking FAQs that we have available to tell you how to um, set up audio encryption uh, or set passphrases on your devices. And for the last slide on this topic, our best practices for networking in the Dante realm, use unicast Dante unless AES67 is especially necessary. It just cuts down on network traffic. Um, if you have a QSC Core 510 that incorporates Dante or if you're uh, routing audio from sure device to sure device, you can use Dante since it's unicast and it will cut down on a lot of that multicast traffic. Make sure if you can, uh, set your video streams or if you have other NVX or some other video stream devices on the same network, um, either separate them to something else, a different VLAN, or you'll need to use something like IGMP snooping to sort of mitigate those flooding issues. Um, use QoS or quality of service and prioritize packets for slow or heavily loaded networks. And on the security side, consider access control. Who has access to this network? Who has access to the physical ports? But also, once you have um, access on a physical port, who has the ability to open up Dante Controller? Who has the passphrases to all of the web GUIs, but also the encryption passphrases between uh, Dante devices if it does uh, enable encryption? So consider the access control uh, or work with the IT administrator or network engineer on, on those access control practices. I think lastly here, we have uh, troubleshooting, common networking issues. And we'll get to some of the questions here. I, have, I know we have a number of questions that came in, but we'll probably try to wrap through this topic five and then we can get through the rest of those. And we got all the time in the world, my man. So take right. your time. All right, perfect. So as we get into troubleshooting, common network issues. Uh, first, what do the IT people want to know? Um, from the first couple of slides, it's how many devices and how many IP addresses. As we know, the, a physical device may have multiple IP addresses, maybe one, two, potentially three. Uh, make sure you document uh, either the number of devices that you're putting on the network, but also that you have the DHCP scope if you're given a range that can fit all of those addresses. If you're dealing in a static IP range, make sure you have enough IPs for that. Are you using static, DHCP, or link local? You can figure all of these things out with the IT administrator or prior to going on site to commission. Um, are you placing this all on an AV VLAN? Is it going to be commingled in a corporate network with other devices, or are you running this on a standalone network? And then also, which ports and protocols? Uh, the ports and protocol sheet that we had is very useful for anyone mer uh, merging or working with IT. They should be aware of all of the discovery, control, and monitoring protocols that Dante uses, but also that Sure uses for discovering and sending updates and such. So the IT people, if you're working with them, or if you are, these are good things to know for first commissioning and network. Some of the tools that we use on a fairly daily basis that I use often with integrators um, and other vendors. First, it's the web device discovery app, uh, Sure Web Device Discovery, which will show you or tell you the IP address of any Sure device, usually the ones that don't have an LCD screen. Um, 
the MXA310, for example, or the MXA910, uh, which are the either the little small puck or the ceiling array microphone, they don't have a, an LCD screen to tell you what the IP address is, and that's what we use Sure Web Device Discovery for. The update utility is useful for updating firmware on every Sure product. Um, one thing I'll say, if, if you do have the Dante Firmware Update Manager, to not use that to update the firmware of any Sure devices. Please be sure to use the update utility, which packages the Control, Web GUI, and Dante firmwares in one solid device. If you were to use the Dante Firmware Update Manager, we don't support that, and it could cause some issues. So make sure when you're updating Sure devices, use the update utility itself. Um, also free is Autonate's Dante controller, which is a basic matrix mixer where you can you can route Dante transmitters to Dante receivers. Say channel one goes to channel one of a DSP and so on. Optionally is Dante Virtual Sound Card, which is a great thing to have in your toolbox or installed on your computer. Uh, when you have Dante Virtual Sound Card running, your computer acts as a Dante endpoint. So uh, in the example of commissioning, commissioning in the MXA, you'll want to listen to the lobes or you'll want to listen to the microphone system, whatever system it is, prior to it going to the codec. Because once it goes through a codec like Zoom, Skype, WebEx, they're squashing to do a bunch of compression, EQ, and things throughout that codec, and it might not sound as you like it on the other end. But if you're commissioning the system, have some way to route the audio directly before any processing, before the codec. You can use a, um, a Dante headphone amp. Uh, I think Focusrite, I think another uh, few other manufacturers make Dante headphone amps where you can route the audio from your wireless system or route the audio from um, the MXA directly to that or a virtual sound card. And next, these are two more IT-centric softwares, uh, but I use them also on a daily basis, is an IP scanner. We'll go to the next slide. IP scanners uh, are useful if you either don't know the lay of the land and you want to see which IPs are taken up, you want to avoid IP address conflicts. So it's um, useful to have an IP scanner. This one, Advanced IP Scanner for Windows. I think Angry IP is available for Mac and Windows as well. But you can use something like this to either search for IPs that are in use uh, and tell you which ones are used by Sure products or any other products that you have. And the uh, next, or do you have something to add there? Nope, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Not for this one. Right. Next slide okay. we have is uh, Wireshark. Wireshark, it's a great like packet sniffing tool is what it's considered, where if you run this application on your computer, uh, you can essentially see which multicast and which other unicast packets are going to your devices, and you can troubleshoot problems in on a network or in the Dante domain uh, you can see really any and all packets, whether they're DHCP requests, Bonjour discovery packets, um, precision time protocol packets, even uh, if you're getting really deep into the weeds of things, you can see um, VLAN packets or, sorry, uh, tags on real time uh, protocol packets for like uh, video or audio streams and things like that. Wireshark is pretty useful, pretty useful for diagnosing if you're not seeing sort of clocking data or if you're not seeing discovery data, you can diagnose um, from their uh, viewing screen there what packets you can see. And once you start the capture, it'll sort of look like the matrix where you have um, bits and you have ethernet frames and other IP information going down the screen, but you can use this and sort of filter down to the packets that you want to see. Yeah, one of the things um, to remember with Wireshark or any other kind of uh, packet capturing software is that depending on the type of traffic and how the switch port you're connected to is set up, you may not see all the traffic on the network. Mm -hmm. If there are unicast flows that are being sent between specific IP addresses and specific MAC addresses, um, that packet uh, may not egress the port that you are connected to, so you may not see it. And to overcome that, a lot of times um, switch manufacturers have a functionality built in called a port mirroring or port monitoring or mm -hmm. span port as it's referred to in some instances. So you might have to set up a span port that mimics the port of a um, 
connected to the device you're trying to troubleshoot to be able to really see the whole picture. I agree. Yep. Good yeah. point. And lastly here, top five problems that we often see. Uh, this is you know, over the years of, of troubleshooting, working with integrators or other vendors, uh, people in market development. These are usually the problems we see, if not on a daily or, or a weekly basis. First, it's your devices, your devices or computers that are on different subnets. Either your um, receivers and DSP, they're operating in a link local 169.254 range, but your computer or something else you're trying to connect to is on a 192 or a different IP space. Ensuring that these devices or the applications themselves, like Dante Controller, are listening on the same subnet, are talking on the same subnet, uh, is probably one of the major things we see on a day-to-day -day basis, where a customer's computer may be on a, a different IP range than what they're trying to see. Also using unqualified switches. Uh, we mentioned the disqualified switches list before or not configuring properly your switches, making sure to disable energy efficient ethernet, um, configure IGMP or any multicast filtering properly if you need it, making sure not to use a switch that, you know, it's a consumer level switch when you're trying to build a scaled, a scalable, um, highly redundant network on say a college campus or in a stadium. You get what you pay for for those switches and much like a computer or any other device, um, Every switch has a finite memory and its CPU processing speed. So once you get into those lower level switches, they may be good for troubleshooting uh, a device, but when you're starting to build into you know, dozens of devices, making sure you have a qualified switch is important. And verifying your firmware, uh, either that it's not corrupt, if insure devices, if you see a firmware number and an asterisk after it, that means there's a corrupt firmware installed. Um, if you have incompatible firmwares, sometimes you're, you're dealing with wired, like Microflex wireless systems, where all devices need to be on the same firmware version to be compatible with each other. Or if you're running outdated firmware, uh, these, as firmware revisions come out, you're getting a number of bug fixes, improvements, new features and things. So keeping up to date with the firmware packages is also important. Updating your applications. Uh, the update utility, wireless workbench, um, could be out of date and not be able to see newer, newer devices, newer manufactured products. So if you're really, um, if you're running older versions of the update utility or wireless workbench, make sure you update those to be able to see either newer devices or work in newer feature sets. Firewall issues have also been a problem, um, allowing the applications through your firewall on your computer or working with your IT department if they have a group policy in place that says block any application besides a specific one, make sure apps such as the update utility, wireless workbench and such um, have been allowed through your local firewall there. And then lastly, but one of the most important um, in my previous you know, time as a network engineer, cables, Yes, really, cables have been a, a major player in, I've seen insurance companies go down for days, uh, all tracing back to one essential cable. They bring in a network consultant because they weren't able to figure something out. And all of a sudden it's because either one cable was taken out because of a faulty clip or something became corrupt on a cable. There are a lot of CRC errors or errors in the switch that you can see. Cables, are really the streets and roads for all of our um, audio devices on the network, making sure that those cables are um, sound, have been tested, verified, that the clips clip into the switch is uh, very important. It's a problem we see often. Yeah. So, here are some resources that we have available. Um, if you're on sure.com, there are a number of FAQs as well as technical publications. If you're on pubs.sure.com, you have access to all of the uh, downloads, sort of PDFs of our documentation, of user guides and such. Even CAD drawings, I think, are on um, a certain part of this, this site. Uh, if you want to get any software downloads, that's sure.com slash software. Uh, trying to reach out to Sure support, you can always email us at support at sure.com or give us a call anytime. We're available 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Send us an email with any and all questions 
um, things that you're going into uh, commissioning a job or if you have specific problems, reach out to us there. We have online training available at our Sure Audio Institute. I believe sure.com slash training and that link should still um, be correct. But if you are on the Sure Audio Institute, we have a number of resources for training, getting up to speed on AES 67. If we didn't go into depth here on um, AES 67, subnetting, um, precision time protocol, we have a, a lot of resources available for you. All right. So, um, yeah, the questions are coming in. Um, shall we just keep yeah. working through that list if you guys don't mind? Yep, yep, definitely. Yeah, uh, so. yeah, we've come to the end of it here, so we should understand networking basics, and uh, we have some questions. Hold one moment here. Yeah, we got no problem. Everybody can kind of get those. I'll, uh, I'm going to throw this one to Ben real quick while Joel's pulling up some other stuff. Uh, ben, I think you saw mm -hmm. this in your sheet there. Uh, what technologies yeah. would you suggest are becoming common practice in live touring? Uh, I.e. past understanding IP address subnets. What does an audio tech need to know these days? Specific switch management aspects, things like that, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think I, I do think that a, a core understanding of IP addresses and subnets, kind of what uh, Joel has outlined here, is very important. Um, but I also think one of the concepts that um, really needs to be understood, kind of building upon that, is uh, VLANs and how they work. Um, how trunk ports work, how access ports work, what you know, what does it mean to put a VLAN tag on something? What does that actually look like? I think understanding that is um, pretty important. And I think we're also, you know, um, when you're dealing with um, real-time protocols such as Dante, quality of service certainly becomes important um, in the larger audio networks, um, ensuring you know that 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 clock um, data is prioritized and going to be propagated well throughout the network, um, and I yeah. think we're seeing that expand even more into AS67 and AVB um, from the um, you know the AAA 1588 point to point uh, V2 uh, and with some you know with 2110 and all of that. I think understanding the protocols is going to be pretty important, especially in the as we get deeper into these. Okay. Um, into these uh, real-time, you know, networked audio applications. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, IP addresses, subnets, VLANs, okay. understanding how the protocols work and what's required of them, um, getting familiar with switches. Yeah. Um, there's so many brands and different types of switches out there. Yeah, knowing mm -hmm. how to do basic troubleshooting on them, right. um, you know, set up queries and things like that is is important. Yeah. Um, so I think kind of taking a, an independent look at everything that we've discussed today um, is a really yeah. good um, place to kind of start and keep growing. Um, I did get, uh, you know, people have asked questions and this was one that came to me offline before uh, the webinar here was, you know, are, are certifications such as the Cisco CCNA, things like that, are they recognized in our industry or required or is that something you know, that people are looking for. And I, I would say largely in our industry in entertainment, live entertainment, it, that's not really um, a requirement by any means. But I do think there's a lot of uh, good information that can be gleaned from some of those networking programs and not necessarily the Cisco specific yeah. ones, but even doing certifications such as the Shore program and the Dante programs um, and some of those others offered that are, you know, somewhat protocol specific um, are really helpful. Yeah, I think that's a good point, and um, uh, we'll see if my internet holds up uh, with my picture on. But um, uh, you bring up an interesting point about um, the configurations, because so many configurations are unique to the product. You know, if you're using a Luminex switch, if you're using a Cisco switch, if you're using um, uh, a, uh, a lab amp, if you're using a uh, Sure device, many things are yeah. very consistent right yeah. the principles are all the same which is what we wanted to discuss here today but how they're implemented does vary manufacturer to manufacturer right and so yeah. um people may generally like the idea of being able to um say okay well tell me the best switch to use well 
that's that's not exactly a, a simple answer, right? But yeah. the the seeking out that information, that knowledge, and I think that's one of the points we wanted to get here. I'm going to shut up for a minute and let us keep going through some questions. Joel, uh, you see some one, interesting ones one there, thing right? just to add real quick, yeah. uh, Kelly, about the uh, uh, what what's the best switch to use? A quick question to ask is what's on premise already? Because I wouldn't start mixing uh two and three brands of switch uh if i've got kind of a, a legacy switch of cisco i might stick with uh that so they behave similarly so i don't have to fix one problem and i haven't fixed it on the other two switches the same way so mm -hmm. just that maybe that's obvious but that's a, a factor yeah. that we sometimes can run into yeah absolutely yeah. i totally agree on that and, and we have a question um, yeah, here that uh this is can you give a rule of thumb for an unqualified switch so. and uh, from what I've seen, any switch that on the packaging, it says we have green ethernet or it has a little leaf that says green energy efficient ethernet. That is a, fr a red flag to um, say, don't use that switch. When you're dealing with other unmanaged switches, I've seen some that incorporate IGMP snooping and you can't really do anything about that if it's unmanaged. So um, the main thing really is green ethernet. Oftentimes I stay or shy away from switch manufacturers that I have not heard of. As usually at the lower uh, price level, even on Amazon, there are the switches that are like, you know, 20 bucks or something. Probably stay away from switches like that. Even they, they may say that they're web managed or managed. Um, when you're dealing with DSPs and microphone systems that are, you know, multiple thousands of dollars and you're going into large environments, switches like that are, are along the same lines as you get what you pay for. Um, every switch, like a computer, has a finite has finite resources, memory, CPU. So those are just some things or rule of thumbs that we deal with. Yeah, yeah, and it's I think um, one of the biggest things outside of you know the um, making sure that your layer one or your cabling and physical plant is all in order and mm -hmm. and proper is um, is just really going through your switch configs, understanding what all is going on, and and, and being proactive issues, about um, uh, you know redoing them or um, reflashing them when they come back from a gig or something like that. Somebody may have logged in and changed a pretty basic or simple setting that could really mess you up on the next gig. Uh, mm -hmm. That's something that we've tried to um, we've tried to kind of mitigate at Claire is um, and um, really work on standardizing switch configs and making sure that they're enforced and reloaded because so that, that can become a big deal. I've uh, got in the habit of. Uh, particularly when doing Bolero events and having Luminex switches, which I like on the show, is just doing a factory reset on the Lumin Luminex switch uh, yeah. uh, right away, because yeah. who knows what's been done in it. And and every single time I've done a factory reset, bing, it started starts working right away without any problems. Yeah, and those Luminex are great because they have, a lot of them have that preset recall. Some of them you yep. can even do it from the front panel, which is a really nice feature. Nice. Um, yep. That you can just kind of pop on there, zero and, it out. And 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 you know. they all have their managed IP listed on the back of it. So if you don't know how to get in, it's written right on the back of the switch. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's yeah, really nice. And yeah, I think along those lines as well, um, it it is tough. You know, some of the switches that can be a little more intimidating from an approachability perspective. You know, some of the Cisco, you know, a lot of them, the higher end or you know, Catalyst series and things like that are CLI based. Um, and getting some familiarity with some basic commands can actually get you a long way in those in those kind of switches. Uh, once you get to that kind of certain level, a lot of the switch, a lot of the commands are somewhat interchangeable. The syntax is going to be different, but if you kind of have an understanding of what you're looking for, you can kind of um, diagnose and troubleshoot some of those. So I think that you know, going back to that earlier question about things to know is yeah, the basic uh, familiarity um, with some of those CLI interfaces as well is probably a good idea. I agree. Yeah. I have a question here along the same switch line. When you're configuring switches or multiple switches in a network uh, and you're flashing that config to all switches, if that switch is configured to be the querier, all switches would then be set up as a querier. Since any one network only uses one querier, do the switches auto negotiate to just one? So I'll bounce it off of you as well, Ben, but uh, typically you would want to maintain one IP address or one courier for your VLAN. There are other switch manufacturers, I think Juniper, where they they do a, a courier election process. If there are multiple couriers in the environment, there's an, an election process that will go through. 
Um, I think it's either the lowest or highest IP wins, I forget which one, but maintaining one single courier per switch, making sure you're not statically configuring that IP if you're going to flash that configuration across multiple switches. Um, you have anything to add to that there, Ben? No, I think I think you're spot on with that. Yeah. And yeah, it's not necessarily part of or a standard practice to do a query or election. You know, right. like like you said, some manufacturers and vendors do support that, but it's not necessarily, um, uh, you know, true across the board. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, well, is there a suggestion for IP scanner programs? Any other IP monitoring programs? So. The scanning ones we mentioned earlier, um, advanced IP, I use all yep. the time on mine. Same. Yeah, there's I, Angry IP Scanner, which is available for Mac and PC. For mobile, I think there's Fing. Um, there's a bunch of other IP scanners. They come a dime a dozen. Yeah, Fing, Net Analyzer. Yeah, there's there's so, all kinds. And, and for, the for the most part, they generally do the same thing. So these um, are some of them will do more advanced, like it'll actually go into the services and look at open ports and tell you what's running. But um, you know, sometimes a lot of the things that we deal with aren't really standards, you know, from that perspective. So it might not identify um, specific applications, but yeah, there's there's all kinds. Just kind of have to download a few, see what you like. Yep. Comfortable with. Another question here, does the Sure update utility always update the Dante side or can you update the receiver software without the Dante or is it always all in one? In the Sure realm, it's all in one. You're updating both the control and Dante side. However, um, you may notice in, in older firmware versions, if we're updating from version three to four on the Sure side, we may still have a Dante version that is version 3.9. Um, and it may stay version 3.9 on Dante, even though we've updated you know, for version two, three, and four on the control side. But we have vetted, we've tested the Dante chipset along with our control chipset and using the Sure update utility, it will update both as it sees fit. If we have an update to the Dante side um, with a new firmware rollout, it'll be included with that. But just to make sure the update utility is the way to update both the control and Dante side, it's all in one for us. Uh, other manufacturers may do it a bit differently. Yeah, and I would try to be conscious of that for other manufacturers as well, because that is pretty common practice to ensure that interoperability between the two firmware stacks mm -hmm. um, or with the rest of the devices on the network. You know, Dante has made it easier over the years to update their own firmware from directly within their uh, controller and utilities, yep. um, but just be careful with that. Yep. Along the software realm, um, will Web Device Discovery App find the IP of Sure Accent show link? Um, no, it won't. Uh, the show link is visible in Wireless Workbench though. So the update utility, I'm sorry, web device discovery is used mainly for like MXA, Microplex Advanced, ANI, MXW items, things that don't have an LCD screen. When you're going into the, the pro side for wireless systems, Accent Digital, um, UHFR, um, ULXD, QLXD, all of that uh, discovery is done in Wireless Workbench. So, no, unfortunately, you cannot discover ShowLink in. Yeah, what I've always had a problem with is if I get a rental system with ShowLink mm. and somebody set a specific IP, I can't get it into the same range as the, as the rest uh, of my stuff, and I have yeah. to resort to doing a factory reset on it and changing my computer to 169 and mm -hmm find it and then log on and then set it to what I want, you know? Yeah. And let's see here. Um, yeah. A few that have come in here. Expand yeah. on why energy efficient ethernet is bad. Um, this is due to Dante's implementation and how they use audio over IP. Um, energy efficient ethernet will put a port into, into a low power state or essentially shut down that port when there is low transmission or when nothing's transmitting across that port. So in the Dante scenario, if you're dealing with two Dante products and they're communicating to each other and then they sort of stop for some reason or they're just, the conference room is not being used, a switch with EEE on it will put that port into this low power state. 
and upon resuming a conference or something, the Dante audio will not be present or um, it can have glitchiness or some weird artifacts in there. So we're beholden to Dante's implementation of their chipset and they've specified EEE is something you must turn off. Um, they have a, an FAQ on why not to use EEE. I think they go more into depth on things like that. Yeah, and along the lines of, you know, this kind of ties into EEE and also identifying, you know, disqualified switches and things like that. Um, one of the things you do want to be careful with, and this can lead into a whole other discussion, so I'm not going to get too far into it, is other protocols um, that allow re redundancy built into the network, things like spanning tree, aren't necessarily recommended to run on Dante networks, although sometimes in the enterprise, you or if you're interacting and incorporating with another network, you can't get away from it. So understanding um, some of those redundancy protocols, such as link aggregation and span entry, um, again, a little bit outside of the topic of our discussion today, mm -hmm. um, but those are things to be aware of that can cause audio glitching or dropouts or unexpected behavior. Yep. See what other questions. Yeah, I see a question here asking about best practices in touring with multiple switches. Um, whether it's stacking switches or running dedicated VLANs for or, uh, lines for each VLAN. Um, I, I, from my perspective, stacking is a great technology. If um, if you need the port density, you know, if you need a bunch of, say, you need 96 ports or whatever for Dante in a specific location, stacking gives you that logical management. So it's like you're managing one switch as opposed to many. Um, but I would be careful with that, um, especially uh, switches that have what they call distance stacking technologies. I've seen where folks may try to um, stack switches when they're in physically different locations. Um, and so it's basically like tying them together with fiber um, and stacking you know, your amp racks in your front of house just because it makes the management easier. Um, the problem with stacking oftentimes is that the control plane is actually uh, handled by one elected switch within that stack. Uh, so if something were to happen to that switch, you either um, trigger a re-election or some of the switches um, might just stop forwarding traffic because they no longer have this controller that's telling them what to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I would I would say be careful with stacking. Um, I would also say, you know, make sure if you're running redundant Dante to try to keep that infrastructure as separate as possible. Um, you know, separate power sources, um, you know, different feeds, different power feeds if possible. If you can get away with diverse paths for your cabling, the interconnect between them, you know, that's great. Do that. Um, you know, I think there's a few a few things like that that you can kind of do to really um, to really help uh, increase the redundancy and the resiliency of the network um, um, without getting too complicated. Mm -hmm. Another question we have. Uh, this is a good one, actually. Any suggestions for the guys on the specifications we should look for when buying a switch to practice switch management at home in these times of lockdown. I'm based in the UK, so it could be a while. Uh, yeah, there are a few, uh, some that we mentioned on the disqualified switches list. We make some recommendations. We by all don't certify every you know, switch that's out there. There are a lot of switches that will work. Um, we just, um, we have seen in practice a number of switches that are prevalent, even at trade shows, even at the Autonate booth at the trade shows, the uh, often using Cisco SG, like the small business switches. They have um, eight port ones, 10 port Cisco SG switches. So if you're looking for one at home uh, that incorporates uh, management or you can log into it, you can set port mirroring, um, you can uh, configure IGMP snooping, um, mm -hmm. disable energy efficient Ethernet and such. The SG line of switches from Cisco, uh, they're fairly inexpensive too, mid 100s for like the smallest SG 250, uh, maybe two or 300 for the larger. Uh, they're SG also switches. pretty readily available from resellers who sell reconditioned equipment. Yeah, so if, it's, if it's a switch to practice on at home and you don't want to spend a lot of money, mm -hmm. you can get a pretty good Cisco switch from a reconditioned reseller. Yeah, nice. absolutely. And you just can look that up online, look for reconditioned Cisco switches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that yeah. was that was kind of what I was uh, curious about is that if I got myself a cheap managed switch, learning the principles of VLANs, right? Getting mm -hmm. multiple computers in my house and different devices that might be around. So I get to understand 
the addressing, while every device is different, it sounds like that principle though yes, would exactly. would transfer, right? Um, the, the idea of best practice. It would definitely. Um, the best practice of setting up VLANs, you can even, even in uh, your house or somewhere, you can set up separate audio visual VLAN from your sort of control or PC VLAN, just to get the idea of how that works. Um, disable some of the protocols that Dante recommends to disable or configure properly. Um, that would be useful on something like the Cisco or a D-Link DGS switch. Um, there are a number of other manufacturers, Luxol, Luminex, Package, um, really HP. Depend, yep, HP and Brocade switches. So, yep. Also, right. if you're if you're working with VLANs uh, with your practice switch, uh, I know PCs are the same way, but also uh, Macs can set up multiple VLANs right in their network page. And uh, I did a show with uh, Josh Flower. They had three different VLANs for different aspects of the show all on the mm -hmm. same network. And mm -hmm. I ran all three of them on one one Mac with different software. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, different, different. They were browser-based uh, web GUIs. So I just had different browsers open on different networks. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of VLANs, I don't know if this was made clear. I, I did step out a way to make tea at one point, so I may have missed it. Uh, but uh, my understanding of VLANs is that that is a hardware thing where you are you are directing switches which ports can talk to which ports, whereas subnets are a more of a software thing where it's it's directing traffic keeping them apart, but they're all available to all the ports. So you could, as I understand it, have circuits within the same subnet on different VLANs that cannot talk to each other. Is that correct? I, correct. I mean, I, I, I could be wrong there, but so I, I mean, that's, I think, sort of a critical difference between isolating your data with VLANs versus isolating your data with uh, subnets. Right. Both yeah. of which are very effective at isolating data. I love the way Luminex does VLAN with different colors. You just go in, select That's the nice. port, dial up a blue color, and then go to another switch, dial up the blue color, and bang, they're connected. Yeah, yeah. Pathport's very easy, too. They've got a yep. dial on the front of the thing that yep. with an LCD. The problem is that their connectors go intermittent very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Who needs yeah. connectors? <laughs> yeah. We're wireless, aren't we? Everything's wireless. All yeah. wireless. Yeah. Uh, you got some more questions there that you guys would like to address? Yeah. I, um, there was one earlier in the show. Somebody was asking about a um, discovery issue with wireless workbench when they have a VPN connected, um, and that is that can often be the case um, depending on how the VPN works. If it's tunneling all of your traffic or only tunneling specific subnets. Um, and if the VPN is only tunneling specific subnets and it happens to overlap with the show network or the control network you're interacting with, a lot of times that traffic will be intercepted by the VPN to be tunneled to its remote destination. Um, and then you it, that's why you are unable to use, you know, that local discovery, those local discovery tools is because that traffic isn't never actually making it onto your physical network. It's being routed somewhere else. Um, and so, yeah, VPNs can often interfere with uh, discovery of wireless workbench, but other software as well, you know, if it's required on a local layer two uh, mm -hmm. discovery. So we have another question here. Um, where was it at? This is earlier in the discussion. Can anyone comment on ways to protect against accidentally bridging primary and secondary networks in Dante? Uh, any question. clever ways to make it so that doesn't bring that the whole, or it doesn't bring the whole thing crashing down if a stage hand picks the wrong port? I saw that earlier and I wanted to interject a point about it then. Mm -hmm. Patching the network is one of the most critical parts of your system. And if you are responsible for the system, a stagehand does not patch it. Indeed. Someone yep. with authority patches it and everybody else leaves it alone. Yeah, yeah this one this one is really difficult um, because there, there's not really a, um, you know, a, uh, silver bullet answer to that. Um, you know, sometimes I've seen people 
you know, try to mitigate it with applying um, access control lists and limiting, you know, certain, you know, traffic that just isn't allowed to come through a port. Um, but that has other caveats as well and isn't always 100% effective. Um, you know, I, I do think that, like Max said, um, those particular things just, you know, if it's just, if you're in an environment where there's, you know, other people involved or that may not know as much about the system as you, it's just something you have to take in. Um, you know, responsibility for and do yourself. And and also going back to the labeling and then just making it is, it, you know, again, not 100% foolproof, but making sure that everything is clearly and properly labeled to try to really... And, and being consistent, obvious. always put your primary above your secondary when you rack it or wherever mm -hmm. you sit it on a table. Don't accidentally switch them because then yeah. you're just asking for trouble. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and making those, and making the labels obvious enough, obvious enough to identify you know, easily where the problem is, you know, things like that. And yeah, just, yeah, like you said, Pete, being consistent. Well, I know that, that in, in audio, in comms, we're fastidious about labeling our cables, but I almost never have seen a network cable labeled on the end of the cable. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, <laughs> so when it comes unplugged, you don't know where that cable came from. Exactly. Yep. It's a good practice, but yeah, it's a rarity that I, I've seen the, the labels. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and you know, outside of the um, you know getting Dante primary and secondary interconnected, um, you know, you're also susceptible to loops um, in the network. That's another big problem, um, and that I mean that can cause issues as well. And I've seen devices when a loop is present in the network, all of a sudden they just output like full scale noise out of the analog outputs and you know, you know things like that. Um, it's all the uh, Lum the Luminex have a, a, a part of their software prevents the loops. It just breaks it mm -hmm. itself mm -hmm. yeah i think i think that's our link x i think is there yeah, exactly I think that's right. their implementation of it um yeah it's that's kind of like a proprietary version of the spanning tree protocol mm -hmm. um with uh, it, i don't fully understand it i haven't had the time to really study it but i think it's got much faster timers than like spanning tree does so that the failover or the link block um happens a lot more rapidly um than in spanning tree because the default spanning tree timers are often pretty high yeah, we yeah, Mac and I were back. were involved in rebuilding some Riedel racks with Luminex switches in it, and when we discovered that it had that capability, we went ahead and and planned to have all of the fiber not only loop the Riedel stuff, but loop all the networks in this in the Riedel racks, because then people won't have to worry about how they plug it together. Uh, huh. See if we have uh, any other questions. I know we have a number of questions. I don't know if we'll get to every one of them. A few here on IGMP. Yeah, maybe let's pick two more. I've got one while you're pondering that. Ben, yeah. I have a question for you selfishly. Um, yeah, what's up? My, my son asked me a question. Uh, he's studying audio technology and he says, do you, do you see a day where the the same way we have a system tech and the same way we have an RF coordinator, will we have a network administrator on site who, who has that understanding of audio and video and that's their job to protect specifically that, not give out a Wi-Fi code to get to the internet? Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that, Ben? I think that's absolutely something that's coming. Uh, I, from, I have been on shows that have been on those shows that way. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I think I think it's out there. Some of the more complicated shows have already implemented that practice. And I do think that uh, it's going to become more commonplace, especially one of the things that we um, it, it's a, it's actually a real struggle in certain ways to, um, you know, we have this concept of what we call the converged network, right, where all these applications are running on the common infrastructure. Um, we believe or, you know, this is more of a personal belief that, I, you know, um, I've kind of developed after interacting with these is that um, that's absolutely something that is going to become more prolific. Um, I think it's the right way to move forward. Um, there's going to be a lot of apprehension and you're going to have to do it right. You know, there's um, because nobody wants all their eggs in one basket, especially a basket that they don't really trust, you know. Um, so I think having a network engineer who's familiar with the protocols that we're using in the entertainment industry and in broadcast and uh, you know, the industries we interact with, somebody who really knows that, um, who can manage these networks really well and understand what is happening when things break is going to be really important. Um, 
but yeah, I definitely see things going that way in the in the future to more of a converged network design. Particularly because com and video and and uh, RF is almost completely switched over to being IP based now. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Yep. And it's IP based, and you want these systems to be able to interact easily. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I want my um, uh, my video CCU or whatever it may be to be able to ship audio um, out of the camera over to my console or so, you know, any number of those examples, you want them all to be able to interact. And there's only one way, you know, that we're really going to be able to do that. And that's getting them all in common infrastructure. Coincidentally, Readle Tuesday coming up is on SMPTE 2110. Wow. wow. What a coincidence. Wow. I wonder, how does this happen? <laughs> That's just by <laughs> magic. Um, uh, yeah, the, and the reason I ask that is because I think a lot of people, when when big market changes happen, mm -hmm. we we panic and we go, where is my place in the world now? Sure. My job that I thought I had or how I did what I did and things like that. And yes, it's difficult. And yes, this is, you know, network is not as simple as we've saw with these tools and with things like that. But it's also a whole new opportunity. It's a whole, you know, to quote Disney, it's a whole new world. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that those are the kind of things that I would encourage people to to not run in fear of. There's there's a lot to learn here. You know, I, I, I'm going to have to get my Network Plus book out again. Uh, like you said, Ben, it's not necessarily about certification, but all these tools that we have out there, um, we're our value is going to be in bridging all these disparate systems. And yeah. it's not gonna be a simple, it's not as simple as, hey, here's an XLR and here's the hardware you're used to having. So much of this is all gonna be virtual mm -hmm. and it, it's gonna take some investment on our part of time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I saw a note about the 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 practicing VLANs and and you're correct, you, you, you gotta have a lot of, of bits to it. I think the the moral of the story there was start with something, right? Yeah. Get a yeah. GUI, start, you know, putting these terms. What do these terms really mean? Pull up the thing, Google it, right? Mm -hmm. Figure out yeah. what that is. And then that that Google monster is a pretty good monster. It's a friendly <laughs> little monster um, and, uh, and everything. So, um, you know, everybody, thanks for joining us today. Um, if people have questions, you know, send them in. There's always a million questions. I'll probably hit you up, Joel and Doug, to uh, we'll have you look over that Google Doc and Ben. If there's some answers that you can, you know, throw in there, um, yeah, we just we love to we love to share information here. And this one, um, April 21, 3 p.m. Eastern, Simpty 2110 with Riedel, and then I can guarantee you we're going to have another conversation, Simpty 2110 with with Clearcom and we're gonna have another 2110 with whoever wants to talk about 2110 because there's four digits that you should probably get in your head that they're gonna they're gonna touch your life. They already do because AES 67 and Dante are all part of 2110. So do some research, there will be a test and um, everybody will enjoy that test though. So uh, any closing thoughts, Mac, Pete? Uh, no, I, I think it was a, a fabulous session. Uh, I learned some things, which is why I'm here sitting here watching. And uh, I hope everyone else did too. No, it definitely yeah. was great. Uh, I too learned a bunch of stuff. And uh, as I said before, I know just enough networking to get me in trouble on a show. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, then I'm always asking uh, other people, well, how do I, I can't get connected. What am I doing wrong? Do, do I need new glasses or something? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and don't look at the laser on the other end of the uh, the fiber, okay? Yeah. Or, or <laughs> put it through the fiber idea. first and don't look straight into the machine. Um, <laughs> exactly. But, yeah, so everybody out there is going to have labels <laughs> on their Cat 5s coming back from Pete now. Um, and it'll probably be a printed, pizza, printed label. labels. No, yeah, none cool. of this scribbled on a piece of tape. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, you think it's tough unlabeling an XLR or an NL. Um, wait till you start doing that to a Cat 5. But uh, <laughs> we'll have that discussion on another day, and we'll save EtherCon discussions and all that fun stuff. What's the best cable? Um, anyhow, thank you again to both uh, to Joel and Doug and Sure for sharing that. Ben, thank you for coming in and sharing your perspective with us. 
and uh, we'll uh, hope everybody stays safe and we'll uh, reconvene uh, back here next week. Have a great weekend and uh, so long. Have a good weekend. Right. Practice, Practice your land. Land. Thanks, everybody. Land. You're welcome. <laughs> Practice V 